that in mind, then let me go to the state and letting the state is here present as the state ready to proceed this morning. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Is the defense ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Council. All right, before we bring the jurors in, uh, which we'll do very shortly here, I also, as we are getting started and before the jurors are sworn and we take evidence, is there, I believe we've already had a motion to exclude witnesses. Let me just clarify on the record, is there going to be a motion to exclude witnesses through evidence portion of the trial made by the defense? Yes, Your Honor. Very well. Uh, the court will reaffirm then there has been a motion to exclude witnesses. So, as the state begins with its case in chief, keep that in mind that uh, they are not permitted to observe the trial proceedings, including the live stream. Uh, the only exception would be for a witness. If they statutorily qualify as a victim, then they are permitted to observe the proceedings. So, each witness is going to be questioned whether or not they've observed any trial proceedings, and I would instruct. Uh, the state and then follow the defense if they have witnesses to make sure that the exclusionary rule is followed. Does the state have any questions on that matter? Your Honor, the state would just clarify and just make counsel and the court aware. It's the state's understanding that through the Constitution and statutorily, victims have a right to remain in the courtroom throughout the proceedings, regardless of whether or not they are victims. And we have discussed that uh, with defense counsel and made the court aware of who we think there may be a crossover with, um, meaning individuals that may be present and also witnesses, but statutorily they would have the right to be here. So including any of the defendant's children, as well as since they were Tammy's children, as well as um, siblings, sometimes grandparents. The court made a ruling last year in the Lori Vallow case. I think if we're following a similar guideline, those are the individuals that we would just note for the record may be present at times, but should have the right to be present throughout the proceedings. In addition, I would just note for the record that we do have our case agent who will be present for the duration of the proceedings, and that's Chief Deputy Vince Kaikamani. Okay, and the state's permitted their case agent. As it relates to victims, uh, the court agrees they are permitted to see the proceedings, including if they are a witness, uh, we would take up on a witness by witness basis whether or not they fall within the statutory qualifications permitting that. And I know the state's aware of the issue. Uh, we'll make rulings tested as to whether or not they would qualify and are later called to testify. Uh, Mr. Pryor from the defense, any further comment or questions on the exclusionary ruling? Nothing further. Okay, thank you. All right, this time then we will have the jurors brought in. Yes, sir. All rise. Oh, the jury's present. All right. Thank you, Mr. Bale. Please be seated. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. We're on the record on Fremont County case CR 22211623, State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Abel. We're ready to proceed with opening arguments and initial instructions this morning to you as jurors. The court notes that the prosecution is present as well as the defendant and the defense attorney. 
representing him as well. We have qualified this panel of 18 jurors consisting of our 12 jurors with six alternates, and they are now seated for trial. Let me start with the state and ask, will the state agree that the jury has now been properly seated and ready to be sworn? Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Will the defense agree as well? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, thank you for returning this morning. You're now seated as jurors in the case before us, as previously been told. Um, I'm Stephen W. Boyce, the district judge of Fremont County in charge of this courtroom trial. I'll briefly reintroduce you to some of our uh, court personnel assisting here today. Shannon Holstein, seated to my right, is the clerk who is keeping minutes of the trial proceedings, will be marking trial exhibits and administering oaths to you as jurors and to the witnesses. Uh, we do have our courtroom bailiffs as well who assist with keeping order in the courtroom and helping the jury move about where they're supposed to throughout the day and then enforcing any conduct orders we have in effect here for the trial. Our um, court reporter today, Amy Bland, is taking a stenographic record of everything said during the trial proceedings and my staff attorney, Courtney Stallings, seated to the far right, who assists me with legal research and administrative matters that come up throughout each day of trial. Each one of you has been qualified, examined, and selected to serve as a juror of this court. The clerk will now have a roll call of our seated jurors. Please, Madam Clerk, if you would conduct the roll call. As to each juror, once your juror number is announced, please just uh, indicate present or here verbally so we Acknowledge that on the record, Madam Clerk. Judge Cleveland, second. Judge 219. Here. Juror 505. Here. Juror 631. Here. Juror 653. Here. Juror 7761. Here. 7751. Here. 7978. Here. 1277. Here. 1271. Here. 1382. Thank you, Madam Clerk. This case has been brought by the state of Idaho. I'll sometimes refer to the state as the prosecution. State is here represented in this trial by Lindsay Blake, the Fremont County Prosecutor. Ms. Blake, if you could please stand briefly. Also, uh, Rob Wood is the Madison County Prosecutor. Ingrid Beatty is a Special Assistant Prosecutor. And Rocky Wixom is a Fremont County Deputy Prosecutor. The defendant in this case, Mr. Daybell, is represented by his attorney, John Carr. Thank you, Counsel. In a few moments, the clerk will read you a redacted version of the amended indictment in this case. That document is not to be considered as evidence. It sets forth the charges against the defendant. You must not consider it as evidence of guilt and not be influenced by the fact that charges have been filed. Mr. Daybell has pled not guilty to the charges contained in the amended indictment. And please remember, again, it's a description of charges. It is not evidence. Under our law and system of justice, every defendant is presumed to be innocent. This means two things. First, the state has the burden of proving the defendant guilty. The state has that burden throughout the trial. The defendant is never required to prove his innocence, nor does the defendant ever have to produce any evidence at all. Second, the state must prove the alleged crimes beyond a reasonable doubt a reasonable doubt is not a mere possible or imaginary doubt. It is a doubt based on reason and common sense. It may arise from a careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence or from a lack of evidence. Mm -hmm. If after considering all the evidence, you have a reasonable doubt about the defendant's guilt, you must find the defendant not guilty. The duty of the jury is to determine the facts 
and then apply the law set forth in the instructions I will later give you to those facts. In this way, you will decide the case. In applying the court's instructions as to the controlling law, you must follow those instructions regardless of your opinion of what the law is or what the law should be or what any lawyer may state the law to be. During this course of the trial, including uh, opening statements, you're instructed that you are not to discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else, including using the internet or social media or any other form of communication electronic or otherwise, do not conduct any personal investigation or look up any information from any source, including the internet, and do not form an opinion as to the merits of the case until after the case has been submitted to you for your determination. The court's given you that instruction now multiple times, and I will continue to give you that instruction. Uh, and again, that's not because I don't think you're not paying attention. Uh, it's just uh, important enough. We'll keep reiterating that. And I will note we received the juror affirmations today from each of the jurors indicating they have followed that instruction. So thank you for that. At this time, then, uh, the next matter we'll take up is to have this jury placed under oath for trial. At this time, then, Madam Clerk, if you're ready to administer the oath, I'll have the jurors stand and be placed under oath. When you stand, then please raise your right hands. You solemnly swear or affirm that you will try to cause now on trial and a true verdict rendered here in accordance with the law and the evidence. So I'll do that. <laughs> All right, thank you. Please be seated. All right, the jurors have already been advised uh, of some of our trial procedures in this case, and I'll just give you some additional general information here. Our normal schedule is to run trial from 8.30 each day until 3.30. At times that will need to be modified for certain reasons. Sometimes we have matters to be argued outside of your presence. Sometimes uh, during the recesses, they may seem to go long because we're conducting other court business outside of your presence. But we will take recesses uh, through the morning and also in the afternoon. If anyone is uncomfortable, needs a break or recess for some specific reason, Please notify the bailiff and we'll do our best to accommodate each of you and keep you comfortable while you're here. In addition, if anyone has any kind of accommodations they need, for example, assistance with a hearing device, uh, other matters, please notify the bailiff again. And we want to make sure you are as comfortable as you can be and able to uh, be alert and attentive throughout the presentation of evidence in the case. These seats that you have been uh, assigned to at this time will be your specific seat throughout the trial. Please return to that same assigned seat each day or after each break so that we are able to determine who's here and someone's not for some reason who's not here. Um, if there are interruptions at times during the trial, I know that can be frustrating, but we'll work our best to keep those to a minimum move the trial as long as efficiently as possible, but at times it just uh, takes time to hear motions that are necessary outside of your presence. And then the uh, courtroom and your location for deliberations, as well as during the trial where it will be held, we provided, uh, of course, access to restrooms and other needs you may have. Uh, I'll address your compensation here. State law allows you for $10 a day for your jury service. However, after five days, that bumps up to $40 a day. So uh, this trial is expected to go some time. You'll likely get into that increased range of compensation, and that's pursuant to Idaho Code 2215. You're also entitled, I believe, to a mileage reimbursement for travel each day. And that can further be explained to you if you have any questions. Um, also, you may notice from time to time, or a lot of the time, I'm looking at monitors here during the trial. I do have case information here, availability to access and research things from the bench. And so, uh, if you notice me looking at those monitors, it's generally to assist me in uh, trial issues that come up. At this time, then the court will. 
provide the jury with some additional jury instructions. As I read through these, it's somewhat lengthy. Um, and I will notify you that you don't have to necessarily memorize everything I'm saying when the trial is concluded and you deliberate, you will have printed copies of these instructions to return to for reference. And if you'll give me just a moment here, I have a brief inquiry to make with my staff attorney. All right, thank you. Now that you've been sworn as jurors to try this case, I'll go over with you what will be happening. I will describe how the trial will be conducted and what, what we will be doing. At the end of the trial, I'll give you more detailed guidance on how you are to reach your decision. Because the state has the burden of proof, it goes first. After the state's opening statement, the defense may make an opening statement or may wait until the state has presented its case. The state will offer evidence that it says will support the charges against the defendant. The defense may then present evidence that is not required to do so. If the defense does present evidence, the state may then present rebuttal evidence. This is evidence offered to answer the defense's evidence. After you have heard all of the evidence, I will give you additional instructions on the law. After you have heard the instructions, the state and the defense will each be given time for closing arguments. In their closing arguments, they will summarize the evidence to help you understand how it relates to the law. Just as the opening statements are not evidence, neither are the closing arguments. After the closing arguments, you will leave the courtroom together to make your decision. During your deliberations, you will have with you my instructions, the exhibits admitted into evidence, and any notes taken by you in court. The defendant is charged by the state of Idaho with a violation of law. The charges against the defendant are contained in the amended indictment. The amended indictment is simply a description of the charges. It is not evidence. Jury instruction number three. The defendant, Chad Guy Daybell, has been charged in the amended indictment with certain counts of entering into a conspiracy with Lori Bell Daybell and or Alex Cox and or other co-conspirators. The crime of conspiracy involves an agreement by two or more persons to commit a crime. You must only consider the evidence against the defendant, Chad Guy Daybell, in this case and should not speculate as to any other case or legal proceedings involving any alleged co-conspirators. You must remember that the defendant, Chad Guy Daybell, has the presumption of innocence, and you must consider his guilt or innocence based solely on the evidence provided in this case. Instruction number four, it is alleged that the crimes charged were committed on or about or on or between a certain date. If you find a crime was committed, the proof need not show that it was committed on that precise date. Instruction number five. Under our law and system of justice, the defendant is presumed to be innocent. Presumption of innocence means two things. First, the state has the burden of proving the defendant guilty. The state has that burden throughout the trial. The defendant is never required to prove his innocence nor does the defendant ever have to produce any evidence at all. Second, the state must prove the alleged crime beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is not a mere possible or imaginary doubt. It is a doubt based on reason and common sense. It may arise from a careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence or from lack of evidence. If after considering all the evidence you have a reasonable doubt about the defendant's guilt, you must find the defendant not guilty. Jury instruction number six. A defendant in a criminal trial has a constitutional right not to be compelled to testify. The decision whether to testify is left to the defendant, acting with the advice and assistance of the defendant's lawyer. 
you must not draw any inference of guilt from the fact that the defendant may not testify, nor should this fact be discussed by you or enter into your deliberations in any way. During instruction number seven, if during the trial, I may say or do anything which suggests to you that I am inclined to favor the claims or positions of any party, you will not permit yourself to be influenced by any such suggestion. I will not express nor intend to express, nor will I intend to intimate any opinion as to which witnesses are or are not worthy of belief, what facts are or are not established, or what inferences should be drawn from the evidence. If any expression of mine seems to indicate an opinion relating to any of these matters, I will instruct you to disregard it. During instruction number eight, your duties are to determine the facts, to apply the law, set forth in my instructions to those facts, and in this way to decide the case. In doing so, you must follow my instructions regardless of your own opinion of what the law is or should be, or what either side may state the law to be. You must consider them as a whole, not picking out one and disregarding others. The order in which the instructions are given has no significance as to their relative importance. The law requires that your decision be made solely upon the evidence before you. Neither sympathy nor prejudice should influence you in your deliberations. Faithful performance by you of these duties is vital to the administration of justice. In determining the facts, you may consider only the evidence admitted in this trial. This evidence consists of the testimony of the witnesses, the exhibits offered and received, and any stipulated or admitted facts. The production of evidence in court is governed by rules of law. At times during the trial, an objection may be made to, question, to a question asked a witness or to a witness's answer or to an exhibit. This simply means I'm being asked to decide a particular rule of law. Arguments on the admissibility of evidence are designed to aid the court and are not to be considered by you nor affect your deliberations. If I sustain an objection to a question or to an exhibit, the witness may not answer the question or the exhibit may not be considered. Do not attempt to guess what the answer might have been or what the exhibit might have shown. Similarly, if I tell you not to consider a particular statement or exhibit, you should put it out of your mind and not refer to it or rely on it in your later deliberations. During the trial, I may have to talk with the parties about the rules of law which should apply to this case. Sometimes that will occur over on the corner there. And we do have a device here that uh, lights out the noise so you can't hear us speaking there. At other times, I'll excuse you from the courtroom so that you can be comfortable while we work out any problems with evidence. You are not to speculate about any such discussions. They are necessary from time to time to help the trial run more smoothly. Some of you have probably heard the terms circumstantial evidence, direct evidence, and hearsay evidence. Do not be concerned with these terms. You are to consider all the evidence admitted in this trial. However, the law does not require you to believe all of the evidence. As the sole judges of the facts, you must determine what evidence you believe and what weight you attach to it. There is no magical formula by which one may evaluate testimony. You bring with you to this courtroom all the experience and background of your lives. In your everyday affairs, you determine for yourselves whom you believe, what you believe, and how much weight you attach to what you are told. The same considerations that you use in your everyday dealings and making these decisions are the considerations which you must apply in your deliberations. In deciding what you believe, do not make your decisions simply because more witnesses may have testified one way than the other. Your role is to think about the testimony of each witness you heard and decide how much you believe of what the witness had to say. A witness who has special knowledge in a particular matter may give an opinion on that matter in determining the weight to be given such an opinion you should consider the qualifications and credibility of the witness and the reasons given for the opinion. You are not bound by such opinion. Give it the weight, if any, to which you deem it entitled.
during instruction number nine, at the conclusion of the trial, you will decide as to each charge whether the state has proved the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The subject of penalty or punishment is not to be discussed or considered by you in making these decisions. That is a matter which must not in any way affect your verdict. During instruction number 10, the state is seeking the death penalty in this case. If the defendant is convicted of murder in the first degree, there will then be a separate sentencing phase of the trial. At that sentencing phase, additional evidence may be presented and the jury will be given additional instructions. At the conclusion of that hearing, the jury will then decide if the defendant will be sentenced to death. If the jury decides that the defendant will not be sentenced to death, either the defendant will be sentenced to a term of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole, or the judge will sentence the defendant to a term of life imprisonment during which the defendant could not be paroled for at least 10 years and possibly for life. Jury instruction number 11. If you wish, you may take notes to help you remember what witnesses said. If you do take notes, please keep them to yourself until after you and your fellow jurors go to the jury room to decide the case. You should not let note taking distract you so that you do not hear other answers by witnesses. When you leave at night, you'll leave your notes here with the videos. If you do not take notes, you should rely on your own memory of what was said and not be overly influenced by the notes of other jurors. In addition, you cannot assign one person the duty of taking notes for all of you. Jury instruction number 12. It is important that as jurors and officers of this court, you obey the following instructions at any time you leave the jury box, whether it be for recesses of the court during the day or when you leave the courtroom to go home at night. First, do not talk about the case among yourselves or with anyone else during the course of the trial. You should keep an open mind throughout the trial and not form or express an opinion about the case. You should only reach your decision after you have heard all the evidence, after you have heard my final instructions, and after the final arguments. You may discuss this case with the other members of the jury only after it is submitted to you for your decision. All such discussions should take place in the jury room. Second, do not let any person talk about the case in your presence. If anyone does talk about it to you, tell them you're a juror of the case. If they won't stop talking, then report that to the bailiff or courtroom staff here as soon as you're able to do that. You should not tell your fellow jurors about what has happened. Third, during this trial, do not talk with any of the parties, their lawyers, or any witnesses. By this, I mean not only do not talk about the case, but do not talk at all, even if you to pass the time of day. In no other way can all parties be assured of the fairness they are entitled to expect from those jurors. Fourth, during this trial, do not make any investigation of this case or inquiry outside of the courtroom on your own. Do not go to any place mentioned in the testimony without an order of the court to do so. You must not consult any books records, internet, or any other source of information unless I specifically authorize you to do so. Fifth, do not read about the case in the newspapers. Do not listen to radio or television broadcasts about the trial. You must base your verdict solely on what is presented in court and not upon any newspaper, radio, television, or other media account of what may have happened. Each day, you will be required, as I mentioned, to sign an affirmation that you will follow this admonition of the court. That concludes the court's first instructions then, and as I mentioned, you will be provided copies of those when you deliberate for further reference. Next, at this time then, I am going to have the clerk read the amended and redacted indictment to you. Madam Clerk, if you're ready to read the amended indictment, and please do that at this time. The District Court of the 7th Judicial District of the State of Idaho and in for the County of Fremont. State of Idaho Plaintiff versus Chad Bagay Bell Defendant, case number CR 22211623, amended indictment. 
Jeff Guy Dago is accused by the grand jury of Fremont County for this indictment as follows. Count one, conspiracy to commit first degree murder with grand theft by deception. The defendants, Chad Guy Dago and or Lori Nori Vallo and or Alex Cox, deceased and or other co-conspirators, both known and unknown, on or between the dates of October 26, 2018 and continuing until January 15, 2020, in the County of Madison, State of Idaho, and elsewhere, including Fremont County, Idaho, and as part of the continuing criminal transaction and common scheme or plan in Madison and Fremont counties, Idaho, that willfully and knowingly combine, conspire, confederate, and agree to commit murder in the first degree of Chiley Ryan and to commit grand theft by deception. Count two, first degree murder. The defendant, Chad Guy Gabel, on or between the 8th and 9th day of September 2019, in the county of Madison, state of Idaho, and as part of a common scheme or plan for continuing criminal transactions in Madison and Fremont counties in Idaho, were concerned in the commission of a first degree murder and did aid and abet in its commission, or not being present, advised and encouraged its commission. Or by command compelled another to commit the crime and did so with malice of forethought and did so willfully, deliberately, and with premeditation, which resulted in the death of a human being, to it either kill Kylie Ryan and or assist in the killing of Kylie Ryan and or did encourage the killing of Kylie Ryan and or did command another to kill Kylie Ryan in violation of their Count three. Conspiracy to commit first degree murder in grand theft by deception. The defendants, Chad Guy Davo and or Lori Noreen Vallow and or Alex Cox, deceased, and or other co conspirators, both known and unknown, honor between the dates of October 26, 2018, and continuing until January 15, 2020, <clears throat> in the County of Madison, State of Idaho, and elsewhere, including Fremont County, Idaho and as part of a continuing criminal transaction and common scheme or plan in Madison and Fremont counties, Idaho, that willfully and knowingly combine, conspire, confederate, and agree to commit murder in the first degree of Joshua Jackson Vallow, here and after J.J. Vallow, and to commit grand theft by deception. <clears throat> Count four, first degree murder. The defendant, Chad Guy Davo, on or between the 8th and 9th day of September 2019, in the County of Madison, State of Idaho, and as part of a common scheme or plan for continuing criminal transactions between Madison and Fremont counties in Idaho, were concerned in the commission of a first degree murder and did aid and abet in its commission, were not being present, advised, and encouraged its commission, or by command compelled another to commit the crime and did so with malice of forethought, and did so willfully, deliberately, and with premeditation, which resulted in the death of a human being. To it, did either kill J.J. Vallow, and or assist in the killing of J.J. Vallow, and or did encourage the killing of J.J. Vallow, and or did command another to kill J.J. Vallow in violation of Idaho Code. Count five, conspiracy to commit first degree murder. The defendants, Chad Guy Vallow, and or Lori Noreen Vallow, and or Alex Cox, deceased, and or other co-conspirators, both known and unknown, on or between the dates of October 26, 2018, and continuing until January 15, 2020, in the County of Fremont, State of Idaho, and elsewhere, including Madison County, Idaho, and as part of a continuing criminal transaction in common scheme or plan in Fremont and Madison counties, Idaho, did willfully and willingly combine, conspire, confederate, and agree to commit murder in the first degree of Tamara Tammy Daybell, and did combine, excuse me, and did combine or conspire to commit murder, and one or more of such persons did an act to affect the object, combination, or conspiracy. Count six, first degree murder. The defendant, Chad Guy Daybell, on October 18, the 19th, 2019, in the county of Fremont, state of Idaho, was concerned in the commission of first degree murder and did aid and abet in its commission 
for not being present, advised and encouraged its commission, or by command compelled another to commit the crime, and did so with malice of forethought, and did so willfully, deliberately, and with premeditation, which resulted in the death of a human being, to wit, did either kill Tamara Tammy Daybell, and or assist in the killing of Tamara Tammy Daybell, and or did encourage the killing of Tamara Tammy Daybell, and or did command another to kill Tamara Tammy Daybell in violation of Idaho Code. Count seven, insurance fraud. The defendant, Chad Guy Dado, on or about October 19, 2019, through October 30, 2019, in the county of Madison, state of Idaho, did with the intent to defraud or deceive an insurer for the purpose of obtaining any money or benefit, insurer or other person, a statement as part of or in support of a claim for payment or benefit, knowing that such statement contained false incomplete or misleading information concerning any fact or thing material to such claim to wit did present and or cause to be presented an insurance beneficiary form to life map assurance company in violation of Idaho code. Count nine insurance fraud that the defendant Chad Magdabell on or about October 19, 2019 through October 31, 2019 in the county of Madison, state of Idaho, did with the intent to defraud or deceive an insurer for the purpose of obtaining any money or benefit, insurer or other person, a statement as part of or in support of a claim for payment or benefit, knowing that such statement contained false, incomplete, or misleading information concerning any fact or material thing to such claim, to wit, did present and or cause to be presented an insurance beneficiary form to Primerica Life Insurance Company in violation of Idaho Code. Signed as a true bill on the 24th day of May, 2021, signed by the deputy presiding grand juror, acting as presiding grand juror in Fremont County, state of Idaho. And to these charges, the defendant is entered a plea of not guilty. All right, thank you very much, Madam Clerk, for reading the redacted amended indictment. In this case, again, I will advise the jurors, remember the indictment is a description of charges. It is not evidence. That concludes the court's opening instructions and reading of the indictment. The jury has been sworn as well. Uh, the next matter we would take up at our opening statements and inquire of the state. Is the state ready to proceed with openings? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, who will be giving the opening statement? I will remember. Very well. Mr. Wood, you may present your opening. Your Honor, may I inquire? Is there a hand mic so that I may address the jury? I think we do have one. Might take us a moment to get it over to you. <clears throat> and then I do have a PowerPoint attached. All right. May I proceed your phone? Yes, it's for that, it's GMI. May I proceed your phone? Yes, you Two dead children buried in the defendant Chad Daybell's backyard in September of 2019. The next month, his wife is found dead in their marital bed. 17 days after the death of his wife, Tammy Daybell, this defendant is photographed laughing and dancing on a beach in Hawaii at his wedding. It's Lori Vallow, a woman who is his mistress and the mother of the children buried in the graves on his property. Three dead bodies. 
This defendant believed he had a right beyond the ordinary. When he had a chance at what he considered his rightful destiny, he made sure that no person and no law would stand in his way. His desire for sex, money, and power led him to pursue those ambitions. And this pursuit led to the deaths of his wife and Lori's two innocent children. Chad Daybell is an author who wrote, tell, who wrote books about the apocalypse. During this trial, you will hear a story more troubling. And the story is real. Chapter 1. The defendant was a seemingly ordinary man. You'll see that he craved significance. He worked in journalism, and he worked as a sexton in a graveyard. He married his wife, Tammy, in 1990 after meeting at Brigham Young University, and they settled in Utah. As a full-time homemaker and mother, Tammy's love for her family was boundless. Together, Tammy and the defendant started a small publishing company, which Tammy supported in many ways. They had five children together. They moved to Idaho, where Tammy became a beloved school librarian. She was devoted to service, her community, and her faith. But for this defendant, that ordinary existence was not enough. Chapter 2. Lori Vallow was a homemaker from Arizona. Your Honor, this mic just... Sorry, Mr. Let's we'll see if we get a replacement mic. I think it's, I got it working out. Okay. I've noticed that the PowerPoint is not up. Yeah, I think your mic's off. Yeah. Okay, I didn't turn it off this time. So, I do my You want us to plug the screen as well? Your Honor, it's up on the screen, and I can't plug in the HDMI. I'm not sure why it's not. Transfer. I don't know if there's any more first down with that. Let's see if we can get some help to maybe see if we can get the signal to work on that. Sorry. Can I proceed? Yeah, but I'm still not sure I want to keep that off working. Check. Okay. Thanks. Apologies for the interruption. I didn't down. Chapter two. Lori Vallow was a homemaker from Arizona. She was married to her fourth husband, Charles Vallow, and she was the mother to Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow. Tylee was a normal, vibrant teenage girl. She loved her friends. You'll hear that she loved her Jeep. She loved Chipotle. She loved her little brother, J.J. J.J. was a seven-year-old boy on the autism spectrum. He required extensive special care needs. He loved his sister. You'll hear about a pivotal date that set in motion the deaths of Tammy, Tylee, and J.J. October 26, 2018. That was a day when Chad Daniel and Lori Bala met at a religious conference in St. George, Utah, where they were introduced by a mutual acquaintance. At this time, both still married to other spouses. That introduction set in motion the reality you're going to hear about. We know what happened next to the defendant's own words. You'll hear. Though both married, Chad and Lori began to have an affair. You will hear excerpts from the defendant's extended text messages to Lori that reveal his mindset and his motivations. In his thirst for sex, power, and money, Chad created an alternate reality 
where they called themselves James and Elena, names that Chad claimed were from past lives they had lived together. The defendant's text messages reveal their story of lust and their plan for a future together. Chad Daybell wrote that upon meeting Lori Vallow, he experienced a happiness unmatched by anything else in his 50 years. He was captivated by her appearance, so much so he said she was out of his teeth. You will hear evidence of his own words, how he was taken by her beauty and spoke about their sexual encounters on many occasions. More than anything else, Chad's obsession with Lori was rooted in her adoration for him. She was the mirror reflecting the grandeur he saw in himself. He called her an exalted goddess. He told her in writing that she had returned to Earth to form a special mission. Part of that mission included being with him. They soon came together and turned their dreams into a plan for the future. One three from what they called obstacles, and those obstacles were Tylee, JJ, and Kim. Chapter three. You will hear that in the world that Chad and Lori planned for themselves, they identified those who stood in their, the way of their dream as dark. Their spouses, Lori's own children, and any who oppose them were labeled sometimes as dark spirits or even zombies. This was more than an alleged belief of frightening labor. The evidence will show that it was a convenient narrative that dehumanized people who stood in their way and who were labeled as obstacles. This narrative gave them the pretext to remove people from this world for their own good. Chad and Lori preached that only through spiritual intervention, what they sometimes called casting, sometimes through burning, or even through death, could these dark spirits be cleansed. Enter Alex Cox, Lori's devoted brother. Chad and Lori manipulated Alex with promises of spiritual rewards. They wielded their influence over Alex, drawing him into their plotting and planning of their own future. After the deaths of Tyler and JJ and Tammy, Chad Daniel gave Alex a blessing. It was this blessing was reported by Lori, who was present. And in that blessing, he said to Alex, You have earned the privilege to be a member of their exclusive religious group. And he also said to him, you have already assisted us in ways that can never be repaid. But you will also see other text messages. Chad and Lori discussed more earthly concerns, that Alex could be the one to implicate them. Alex knew this as well. Shortly before he died, on December 12, 2019, he told his wife, Zulana Pastens, who you will hear from, he was afraid he was going to see Chad and Lori's small guy. Chapter 4. Once their calculated plan was devised, it only took months to execute and remove perceived obstacles in Chad Daybell's path to a new life. Charles Vallow, Lori's husband, who was labeled as dark by the defendant, was shot and killed by Alex Cox in Arizona. Lori stood to gain $1 million, money that could fund Chad and Lori's future. Yet following Charles's death, Lori Vallow awaited a $1 million life insurance payout that never came, only to learn that the beneficiary was no longer her. Upon learning she would not receive that insurance money, Lori would text Chad, I'll still get the $4,000 a month from SS, meaning Social Security. Chad replied to her in a text that read, It will be interesting to see if it got changed after he had two bullets in his chest. Tylee Ryan, also branded dark and a zombie, was last seen on September 8, 2019. Subsequent investigations revealed the horrifying truth. Her remains, charred and dismembered, were found in a grave on Chad Abel's property. Without Charles' $1 million in insurance money to support them, Lori Vallow continued to illegally receive Tylee's Social Security benefits, provided after the death of Tylee's biological father, who had been Lori's third husband. 
According to this defendant, J.J. Ballard, Lori's son, was also possessed. After he was labeled as a dark entity, his fate was no less tragic than his sister's. His young life was also burned. Later, his bound body was discovered buried in Chad's backyard, his death by suffocation. Yet while J.J. was missing, Lori continued to illegally receive J.J.'s Social Security benefits. Money provided by Charles Ballard's dad. Tammy Daybell, a vivacious, healthy mother, was another individual labeled as a dark spirit to be removed. On October 9th of 2019, she reported being shot at at night near her home by a man covered in black. She thought it was a paintball gun. On October 19th, 10 days later, she died in her own home with her husband present. This was soon after an increase in the value of her life insurance to more than $400,000. This defendant rapidly cashed in that life insurance and began looking for condos in Hawaii with Lori. You'll see the rental application he submitted for a couple with no kids. Medical examiner, medical examiners would later determine that the only reasonable explanation for Tammy's death was not of natural causes, but rather a homicide. In fact, you will hear from multiple witnesses that Chad predicted multiple times that Tammy would die in her own death. Chapter five. 17 days after his wife's death, Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow got married he celebrated on the beach in Hawaii, Hawaii, symbolizing what he called their eternal meaning. Chad and Lori were preparing their wedding well before Tammy's death. Lori was shopping for wedding rings while Tammy was still alive. Now, without the earthly obstacles of spouses and young children, and with Tammy's insurance policy and the children's social security funds, they could live the life that Chad and Lori wanted. Nothing was going to stand in their way. Chapter six. Unfortunately for this defendant, reality soon shattered their bliss. Two things led law enforcement to his and Lori's door. On October 2nd, 2019, Lori Vallow's nephew-in-law, a man named Brandon Boudreaux, was shot at in Arizona by someone from what he believed was Tyler's Jeep. Law enforcement in Arizona investigating Brandon's shooting contacted law enforcement in Fremont County, Idaho to look for Alex Cox and for Tyler's Jeep. And you'll hear that that Jeep was later found in Rexburg, Idaho, in Madison County. Meanwhile, J.J. Vallow's grandmother, concerned that she hadn't seen or heard from him in months, asked police for help. The police followed up and located Lori in Rexburg, Idaho where the police did a welfare check at Lori's apartment. Law enforcement arrived at Lori's door on November 26, 2019. When asked about Lori, Chad first told law enforcement he didn't know her very well, despite the fact that they were married and had been in a relationship for over a year. Lies by Lori to police about JJ and Tiny's whereabouts, and then a move to Hawaii and Lori's unwillingness to present her children to law enforcement to prove their well being led to her arrest and extradition. As Lori refused to produce her children, law enforcement continued their search for Tyler and JJ. During that search, they located a unique text message that this defendant, Chad Daybell, had sent to his wife, Tammy, on September 9, 2019 which was when the day after Tylee Bryant's last known appearance. You'll hear from the FBI agent who found that message, but this message seemed longer than his usual text to Tammy, and it had a more conversational tone. In that text, Chad claimed he had an interesting warning that he'd shot a raccoon, that he'd buried it in what they called the pet cemetery, and that he'd had a fire on the property where he burned some wind debris. 
When law enforcement finally went to the defendant's property the following June, they didn't find a raccoon. They found Tylee's burnt remains were buried in the cul-de-sac. And they found JJ nearby, buried under a tree near a pond. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been told this will be a lengthy trial. You will hear from many witnesses. You will hear a lot of evidence. You're going to hear a lot of dates. The following is just a timeline of major events to help understand when these things took place. October 26, 2018, Chad and Lauren meet in St. George, Utah. July 11, 2019, Charles Val, Lori's husband, is shot and killed by Alex Cox. Between August 31st and September 1st, Lori, Alex Cox, and Kylie and JJ moved to Rexburg, Idaho, just a few miles south of the defendant's home. Kylie's last known sighting was September 8, 2019. The text I just spoke of about the raccoon was sent by the defendant to his wife September 9, 2019. JJ's last known site, you'll hear about September 22nd. The attempted homicide of Brandon Boudreaux in Arizona was October 2nd. The shooting I mentioned of Tammy, the shooting, shooting at her, the unsuccessful shooting, October 9th, 2019. Tammy's death, October 19th, 2019. 17 days later, Chad and Lori marry in Hawaii. Law enforcement did a welfare check looking for JJ November 26, 2019 in Rexburg, Idaho. November 26th and 27th, Chad and Lori leave town. June 9, 2020, Tylee and JJ's remains are found on Chad's property. As I said, you're going to hear a lot of evidence from a lot of witnesses. And there's going to be kind of different groups of evidence you're going to hear from. You'll hear from law enforcement, who will, some of whom will give you a broad overview of the investigation and what they did, how the search from Tylee and JJ to a case of murder. You'll hear how it began by people who knew Lori and Chad. The James and the Lane, you'll hear about the James and the Lane story and about their relationship with each other and how they pursued their dream, their plan for a life together. You'll hear in the defendant's own words, people referred to as obstacles, how they need to be gotten rid of. You're going to hear financial evidence. You'll hear from an FBI forensic accountant and a detective, a social security administrator, investigator, who will talk about the finances involved in this case. You'll hear more from law enforcement, from multiple law enforcement agencies, the Rexford Police, the Fremont County Sheriff's Department, the FBI, Social Security Administration, about the investigation into these crimes. You will see forensic evidence. There, you'll see DNA testing to identify the body of Tyler. You'll see DNA testing that showed that DNA from Tylee was found on at least two tools in the defendant's shed. You'll hear digital evidence dealing with geolocation data tied to certain phones that were used in this case. You'll hear from Hawaii law enforcement about searches they performed in Hawaii on the defendant and his wife. And finally, you will hear many of this defendant's own words. You will hear voice recordings of this defendant. You'll hear, you'll hear excuse me, recorded phone calls between him and his wife, Lauren Dayville. You'll read multiple texts that he and Lori sent back and other texts he sent to you. Chapter nine, what's unwritten. The defendant stands before you today, 
charged with multiple crimes. First degree murder to the death of Terry Daybell. First degree murder to the death of Kylie Ryan. First degree murder to the death of JJ Ballow. Conspiracy to commit murder of Tammy Daybell. Conspiracy to commit murder and grant that by such the death of Kylie Ryan. Conspiracy to commit murder and grand theft by deception to the death of J.J. Ballard and insurance fraud. Two dead children buried in this defendant's backyard. The next month, his wife dead in their bed. 17 days later, this defendant marries Lori Ballard. Members of the jury, days or probably weeks from now, when the evidence in this trial is fully unfolded, we will have the opportunity to speak with you again. And at that time, we will ask you to end this horrible narrative. Your verdict will be the link that writes the final chapter of this tragic saga, a chapter that delivers justice for Tammy, justice for JJ, and justice for Tyler. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Wood. That will conclude the opening statement of the state. Uh, Mr. Pryor, a couple of questions. First, uh, is the defense going to give an opening statement now or defer until later? And second, if you are going to give an opening statement, would you prefer we take a mid morning recess or go forward? Judge, could we take a short recess? And I have a Okay, I think this is a good time then for our mid morning break. We'll go ahead and take that now. And then once that's concluded, Mr. Pryor can give us a thanks statement to the events. All rise.
Thank you. Please be seated. Please have the chair, Mr. Rock. All rise. Very present and accounted for. All right, thank you. Please be seated. <laughs> We've concluded our morning recess. We're back on the record on KCR 22, 21, 16, 23, State of Idaho versus Chad Padagayo. This is the time we'll next have. Opening statements by the defense, Mr. Pryor, is the defense ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. May I have the post permission to enter the well? You may. Thank you. And maybe check that microphone to make sure it is working. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as an introduction, I'm John Pryor. I'm the defense attorney for Mr. Daybell. And I'm from Meridian, Idaho. I'm an attorney from Meridian, Idaho over here on the west side of the state. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit today. And um, at my age, video presentations are not something that would come easy to me. So I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about uh, uh, my view of the case and the facts and evidence. And what's important are facts and evidence. I think that when we went through the jury selection process, we talked about facts and we talked about evidence. And the judge gave you an instruction to talk to you a little bit about uh, you take into consideration the facts of this case and not be distracted by other things. Don't be distracted by speculation. Don't be distracted by guesses or assumptions or hunches. It all comes down to facts and evidence. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the facts and evidence of this case. Chad Daybell, uh, uh, and I'm learning this, and I've had some time to learn about this because it didn't come natural to me. But Chad Daybell went on what's called a mission early on in his life. And I guess what a mission is, and I'm not familiar with that, but I guess what a mission is, is they go away to a location and they talk to people about their religious beliefs. And Chad's faith, that was important as part of his faith. And when they returned from these missions, uh, they start the process of moving on with their lives. And when Chad got back from doing his mission in New Jersey, he met Tammy Daybell. Uh, another fact that I discovered, and you'll hear a little bit about, is that Chad had an extended um, uh, engagement, had an extended, by his faith standards, uh, 
uh, romance before they got married. Uh, Chad and Tammy dated for approximately six months. And what I understand is by their nature, six months is an extended uh, dating process uh, before you end up getting married. Uh, so after six months, they got married. They were married in Utah and uh, pr proceeded then to have uh, children. They have five children, now all five adult children. At some point, they moved back here to Idaho or moved to Idaho, and uh, they started a small publishing company. And you'll hear testimony that the publishing company was predominantly run by Tammy. Tammy managed it. Tammy was the brains behind the, uh, the company. And uh, Tammy basically took the reins and did everything that was necessary to move this publishing company. It was a small publishing company, a very small publishing company. And what they did is basically published books. Chad would write these books, and he would write these books about his religious experiences. In his faith, he had certain beliefs, faith that he practiced, you know, when he went on his mission, when he, uh, uh, you know, read his interpretation of uh, the books that he used for his faith, he uh, started writing books about things that were consistent with his faith, things like premonitions. We've all heard of premonitions, about uh, being able to predict things, about being able to see maybe when things happen. And, and some people believe in that, some people don't. Some people have personally experienced that, or I've been here before. But he writes about his premonitions. He writes about um, good and evil, and what it means to be good, what it means to be evil. He writes about dark and light. He writes about um, subjects that are a little darker, like death and maybe the coming of uh, the end of, of things and, and when his savior in his mind is gonna come back and, and maybe there'll be some kind of a redemption of some sort. But his books covered a lot of subjects like that and they were all based on fiction. In other words, he was writing these books about theories and things that came into his head and he would, he would write these, uh, these stories. But he also wrote children's books and he wrote books for teenagers. And he wrote these books about adventures and, and then the, uh, you know, some crazy ideas about things that kids and teenagers get involved in. In about October of 2018, Chad was going out and he was invited by one of the uh, witnesses that you'll hear in this case to, to speak about his books. And this was not uncommon. He would travel and he would be asked to say, well, come and talk about some of the things that you, uh, you believe in. You, you, you talked about these premonitions, it's life experiences. You're going to hear testimony about that. And he was invited on one particular occasion in late October. And he attended this. And while he was there trying to sell his books, and like most of us who are business people, um, the focus of these meetings really was for Chad to try to get his books published because that's how he made a living. And he was there in one of his booths trying to promote his books and he laid them out there. And this beautifully stunning woman named Lori Vallow comes up and she starts giving him a lot of attention and she pursued him and she encouraged him. And you'll hear testimony that she went so far as to grab behind the booth and um, sort of help him in trying to sell some of his books. She obviously had an interest and maybe she felt that he was this, this publisher or maybe she had an opinion. You'll hear testimony about that. And then after the seminar, there was a length of time where there was no contact between the two of them, a month, month and a half, two months. Um, and during that time, Chad Daigle went on his day-to-day -day life. He'd been married to Tammy for some 29 years, uh, has no remarkable background of any kind. I think he, the testimony we offer will show you, I think he had a speeding ticket in 2008. But Lori Vallow was a different story. Lori Vallow was someone who, right out of high school, married her first husband. You hear testimony about this. That marriage was very short lived, very short lived. She then married husband number two a few years later. And again, very short lived marriage. And there's some testimony indication that there were some, some problems with the marriage that uh, 
cause the breakup. But the concern seems to be, the theme seems to be that uh, Lori's brother, Alex, and you're going to hear about Alex Cox. Alex Cox was Lori's protector. Alex Cox would do anything and everything to protect, aid, and assist Lori Vallon in whatever her endeavors, without unbridled question, anything. <laughs> and if Alex Cox even perceived that there was a problem, Alex Cox reacted. You're going to hear testimony that in 2007, I believe it was in August of 2007, Lori Vallow had finished up going through her third marriage with Joseph Wright. It was a tumultuous, you know, her testimony that it was a tumultuous marriage, a terrible marriage. And Lori Vallow made accusations against Joseph Ryan of abusing their child, Tylee. Yes, the same Tylee. And during one of the visits of 2007, folks, and I, I want to tell you, you're going to hear testimony that in 2007, Chad Daybell didn't even know Lori Vallow existed. But Alex Cox, after one of the exchanges and the visitations with Tylee, Alex Cox approached Joseph Ryan and shot him with a taser and assaulted him. Was eventually charged with aggravated assault, was eventually put in jail, and had this on his record. And there was representation, the facts would suggest that at the time Joseph Ryan feared for his life. This was a serious situation. But it set the pattern for what we're dealing with with Alex Cox. Whenever there was a problem or a threat to Lori Vallow, you'll hear testimony that Alex Cox came to the rescue. But Alex Cox would run without even question and do whatever was necessary to solve Lori Vallow's problems. We're going to fast forward then to 2019. Lori Vallow is still married to Charles Vallow. And the prosecuting attorney mentioned this, yes, Chad Daybell at that point, coming in January and February, started to have communications with Lori Vallow. And yes, folks, it turned into an inappropriate relationship. 2019 and forward. And yes, he was engaging in discussions. He was engaging in contact with her. All of the things that uh, the prosecutor talked about in terms of a, a relationship. But subsequent to the seriousness of this relationship getting rolling, Alex Cox was at a visitation in 2019 with Charles Vallow. And Lori Vallow was there. Tylee Ryan was there. JJ was there. They were all present. And during that altercation and that supposed visit, much like with Joseph Ryan, Alex Cox took out a gun and shot Charles Vallow. And then after calling 911, he then finished the job and walked up to him close to range, finished him off. Now, you're going to hear testimony that in some way, Chad Daybell was implicated in that. And, and you're going to hear further testimony that he was not. You're going to hear testimony and see documentation that suggests that the prosecuting attorney on the review of this indicated that there is no likelihood of conviction of Chad Daybell. You'll hear testimony that Chad Daybell had nothing to do with the execution by Alex Cox, Charles L. And the same for Brandon Boudreau. You will hear that Chad Daybell is not being pursued for any involvement in the Brandon Boudreau attempted murder. Those occurred and those are separate as well as the Charles Valley. So what we have is we have a situation where someone who's 29 years old, Chad Dayball, 29 years of marriage with Tammy Dayball, no discernible issues in his life. And then Lori Vallow comes into the picture, Miss Texas, with her testimony about this beautiful, vivacious woman, very sexual person, and very manipulative. And she knows how to get what she wants. And she drew, drew Chad Daybell into a relationship and an unfortunate relationship, you know, that Chad fell and fell into. After that, things started rolling and issues started happening. But eventually, yes, 
there was a murder and there was a burial. And you've heard discussion about the backyard of Chad Avon. Well, we have a four and a half acre farm in Fremont County, Idaho. And you'll hear testimony that the body of JJ Vallow was discovered behind an irrigation pond and a tree out in the pasture. So technically, yes, maybe the backyard, but more accurately described as the pasture hidden behind a tree. You're going to hear testimony that also in the middle of this pasture was a raspberry patch, former raspberry patch that was then turned into a, uh, a place for them to bury the cats, the dogs, and all of the animals on the farm. Okay. Again, out in the pasture of the field and not the backyard. You'll hear testimony about that. You're going to hear from four experts that I'm going to bring forward. And these four experts, the first one is going to be Dr. Greg Hampinkian. And Dr. Hampinkian is a, is a bit of a, a, a notable local from Boise State University. And Dr. Hampinkian is a DNA expert, considered one of the best DNA experts. He's been involved and has significant work that he's done on both the defense and for the prosecution. He was involved and led the team with Amanda Knox in Italy that got her exonerated because of the DNA evidence. He has substantial experience. And anybody or anyone who knows anything about DNA goes to Dr. Hampinkian first because he is the guy. And Dr. Hampinkian is going to talk a little bit about the DNA evidence that was found on the scene. Dr. Hampinkian is going to talk about the fingerprint on the plastic that J.J. Vallow was discovered in was that of Alex Cox. Dr. Hampinkian is going to talk about the hair sample that was found on the plastic of Alex Cox and that it was Lori Vallow. Dr. Hampinkian is going to talk about several, and I mean several other hairs that were found on the plastic of J.J. Vallow. But he's also going to say that there was no DNA evidence no hair sample of Chad Daybell on Tylee Ryan or on JJ Vallow. You're then going to hear from Dr. Raven. Dr. Raven is a forensic pathologist, and she's going to talk a little bit about the circumstances surrounding Tammy Daybell. And what Dr. Raven is going to say is that. There's no indication that this is either a homicide or any other crime, and that the only conclusion she could come to is you can't determine what the cause of death was. There's no way to determine it. Tammy Daybell was buried. You'll hear testimony about that. And then a short time later, the police officer showed up and they dug her body up after she'd been buried after she was laid to rest, and then continued after the body was pulled out of the ground and continued to examine it for whatever they were looking for. And what you're going to find is based on that, Dr. Raven's going to say, you can't determine what the cause of death is. You're going to hear testimony from the Daybell children, from the children themselves, four of the five children, I think, three, three or four of the five children. Testimony. They're going to talk about their mother's health struggles. They're going to talk about their mother's use of various medicinal uh, uh, treatments that she would use, oils that she would put on her leg, medicine and, and, and different herbs that she would take, and that her mother was suffering from, that their mother was suffering from a number of maladies, and that she would refuse to go see a doctor or get it treated. And Dr. Raven's going to enlighten you a little bit about some of the circumstances regarding Tammy Daybell. You're then going to hear from Patrick Eller. He's a, a uh, he's a forensic digital data examiner, and Patrick Eller is someone who has spent his life in the military working uh, uh, for various agencies, and we'll talk a little bit about that within the government to do data retrieval and data research. And he's going to talk a little bit about the phone records that are involved in this case. He's going to specifically talk about the travels of Alex Cox, because you are going to hear testimony that Alex Cox went to 
Chad Daigle's property on the 9th of September. You're going to hear that Alex Cox approached Chad Daigle's property a half a dozen other, five or six other times. You're going to hear testimony that Alex Cox was there on the 23rd. And you're going to hear where Alex Cox was in a number of other times and places in his whereabouts and his travels for about a two, two and a half month period. And Patrick is going to, you know, offer you some information and data to support all of that. And finally, you're going to hear from a forensic anthropologist, and his name's Eric Bartling. And Mr. Bartling is going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the nature and, and, and the, uh, the, the nature of how uh, the, the remains of Tylee were uh, burned. Eric Bartling is going to talk to you a little bit about the lack of complete skeletal remains and why, when Tylee was dug down the ground, there were there was not a complete set of skeletal remains. In fact, there were a number of pieces of that that were missing. You're going to hear a lot of evidence, and the judge has talked to us a little bit about not making a decision until you hear all of the evidence. And there's a specific jury instruction that talks about that. The jury instruction is, you know, consider all the evidence. Listen to the instructions from the court on how you're to proceed. Listen to the arguments of the prosecuting attorney and the defense. And then and only then do you make your decision. And at the conclusion of all that evidence, and at the conclusion of the judge's instructions, the arguments of both of the defense attorneys, I'm going to ask you folks to return the verdict on DT. Thank you, folks. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, that concludes the opening statement of the defense. Then this time we will commence with presenting evidence. Uh, I understand the state does have a first witness to call. Is the state ready to do that? <clears throat> You know, the state is prepared. We we had spoken with your clerk earlier. We thought we were going to have a first sidebar. Oh, let's discuss our schedule and put there in sidebar.
Council, thanks for uh, discussing scheduling. Our intention here will be to start with the state's first witness that uh, apparently will take some time. So we will plan on taking a lunch hour also at uh, right around noon, if possible. So, Mr. Wood, are you going to be calling the first witness? Yes, yeah, sure. And the state will be calling right from the seat. All right. Well, go ahead. Call your witness. We'll have him come up and sworn. Please your right hand this morning. Please swear or affirm the testimony Officer, as you testify, just remember to make a audible response to anything that has been questioned uh, so that the record stays clear and try to avoid speaking over the top of anyone questioning you. That in mind, then, if you would, if you'd like to inquire in that. Thank you, Your Honor. Officer, will you state your name and spell your last name for the record? Ray Hermosillo, H E R M O S I L L O. Is that on? Your Honor, is that microphone on? Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, I want you to go ahead and start over and just talk right in the mic, please. Detective, will you state your name and spell your last name for the record? Ray Hermosillo, H E R M O S I L L O. Thank you. Detective Hermosillo, what is your occupation? I'm currently a lieutenant in the detective division for the Rexburg Police Department. How long have you been a detective? Five years. And how long were you involved in law enforcement before you became a detective? Before I was a detective, 18 years. Have you worked for any other law enforcement agency, agency other than the Rexburg Police? No. And are you post certified? I am. Detective, are you, have you been involved in the case regarding Chad Daybell? Yes, I have. Do you know what Chad Daybell looks like? I do. Is he present in this courtroom? He is. He's of the defendant's table for sure in a low screen time. Thank you. So let's talk about how did you initially become involved into the in the investigation regarding Mr. Dago? On November 1st, 2019, I was contacted by Fremont County Sheriff's Office. I was told that there was possibly a Jeep uh, that was involved in an attempted homicide in our jurisdiction. So at that time, with that information, I contacted Gilbert Police and um, asked what they needed us to do to assist them. What did you do? Gilbert Police asked us to seize the Jeep if it was located. Um, they gave us the address of 565 Pioneer which is Rock Creek Townhomes. They asked, also asked us- I'm gonna stop real quick. Uh, where is that address located? What city? Rexburg. And what county is Rexburg in? Madison County. So once you received that address, what did you do? Gilbert asked us to seize the Jeep if we had located the Jeep. Um, they also asked us to perform intermittent surveillance. So at that time, that's exactly what we did. When you say intermittent surveillance, what, what did you do to perform that surveillance? When we were driving around, uh, when there was no other calls coming in, we would park in front of the residence, behind the residence, take photographs of anybody leaving or coming in. Um, that's, that's basically what we did for the surveillance. And do you recall what date you did that surveillance? 
Uh, the dates were between November 1st and November 4th when I located the Jeep at 565 Pioneer. Did you ever uh, see the defendant at that address? I did. There were a few times during the intermittent surveillance that we had taken photographs of the defendant, Mr. Daybell, and Lori Vallow, um, either coming or going from the residence. And, and that was between the dates of November 1st and November 4th. Judge, could we have a full record of this officer established? I'm sorry, 2019. So, and did you that uh, when you talked about seeing Mr. Davo, was that between those dates of November 1st to November 4th, 2019? That's correct. And your primary job was to look for a Jeep. Is that accurate? Well, yes, that's right. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the witness be handled. what's been marked, the state's exhibit 90. Where well, the court has a courtesy copy and counsel as well. Mr. Wood, to clear up, it sounded like you said 90. This is 9A. I believe it's 90. Uh, I'm glad to see the exhibit so I can confirm my words. It's okay. Fine. You're correct, Owner. 9A. And that would be that it's 9A through 90. Detective, do you recognize state's exhibits 9A through 9B? Yes, I do. What do they report to be? That is the Jeep that I had seized parked in the parking lot just outside of 565. Right. And was this, were these pictures taken at the location of 565 Pioneer? No, these photographs were taken uh, at our in-town lot at the police department. Right. Did you take these pictures? I did not. But do you recognize these images as true and accurate representations of the chief you seized from 565 Pioneer Drive? Yes. Your Honor, I'd ask the state's exhibits 9A through D be under the evidence. The objection from the defense. Judge, I'd like to move on here and make a correction on this foundation. All right. You can word our or ask foundational questions, Mr. Carter. Officer Hermosino, you uh, thank you. You mentioned that you were doing surveillance on the Jeep. Is that correct? That's correct. Right. Uh, did you have an occasion to get close to the Jeep during that surveillance? We hadn't located the Jeep during that surveillance. I located the Jeep on November 4, 2019, and that's when I had it impounded. Okay. And at the time of being impounded, did you have the occasion to go through the Jeep and observe the Jeep energy? Or were you relying just on the photographs taken in the chain? Do you understand my question? No, sir. Can you repeat I'll phrase that? Did you have a personal occasion to go through the inside of that Jeep and observe the contents within the Jeep? Your Honor, I think that that goes beyond the scope of this uh, specific exhibit. Uh, I guess the issue, Mr. Wood, is he indicated he did not take these photographs, and some of the exhibits also contain photographs of the interior of the Jeep. So proper uh more dire and of an objection and may i continue judge yes officer all i'm trying to establish is i don't want you to be able to testify that uh, the uh, you know someone else took the pictures and this is what they found uh, i want you to be able to you're authenticating and, and you're under oath to swear that these are accurate photos i'm trying to find out if that knowledge is based on your personal experience or is it simply based on the fact that you're relying on somebody else who told you this is what we found? So that's what I'd like you to clarify for me if you would, sir. Sure. I impounded the Jeep. I was standing next to the officer taking the photographs. 
And I also went through the G personally. Okay, I would draw the objection. Thank you, Marcy. All right, the exhibits uh, 9A through D are admitted. Thank you, ma'am. I'll look at the jury. You, you may want to have a quick sidebar with counsel. Is it like a reporter? All right, Mr. Wood, if you'd like to proceed with publishing with the court's instructions there on the sidebar, then you may publish that in or all of the photos. Thank you, Your Honor. And if I could have access to the honor. Thank you. Detective, is this is what you saw on state's exhibit A? Yes. Is this the jeep that you had been assigned to do surveillance for? That's right. Did you, did you ever learn who this jeep belonged to? I did. Who did it belong to? 
It was registered to Charles Mallow, but we later determined that Tylee Ryan drove that Jeep. Detective, this is State's Exhibit 90. Is this that same Jeep? Yes. That's all I'm going to publish now. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Detective, while you were doing uh, your surveillance, you testified that you would had occasion to see the defendant Lori Mallow. Did you ever see children return? No, we didn't. Did you ever see anybody, anybody else with them? No. That's true. Were you, at that time, were you aware of who J.J. Ballow was? No. Were you aware of who Tyree Ryan was? No. So when you spoke with, is it fair to say that when you were initially contacted by another law enforcement agency, they did not ask you to look for those children at that time? That's correct. Detective, did your role in this investigation change after that? Uh, it did. When did that happen? After I had seized the Jeep November 4th, 2019, I contacted Gilbert Police and let them know I had the Jeep. Um, Gilbert Police Department flew to Rexburg with a few of their detectives and a few of their crime analysts to go through the Jeep and serve a warrant with the Jeep. They were looking for the infotainment center, which is the middle of the Jeep console. It has the GPS locations, things of that nature, and they want the information extracted. So when they were up here on November 18th, 2019, um, they asked me and the other detectives if during our intermittent surveillance if we had seen any children and we told them we hadn't. They stated that their that JJ's grandmother. Judge, I'm going to object to this. We're, we're, we're I'm trying to be somewhat uh, open minded about foundation, but I'm going to object. I'll ask a question now. Go ahead, Holmes. So, you did have further contact with law enforcement from Arizona? Correct. And which law enforcement agency was that? Gilbert Police Department. And was it Gilbert Police Department that was looking for that chief? Yes, it was. Uh, when you uh, when you followed up with them about the chief, did they give you any other information about their case? They did. Did any of that, in, that information regard children? Yes, it did. How? What were you What were you told by Gilbert Police? Judge objection here, saying. Coming in for the effect on the listener, Your Honor. Judge, can we approach? Uh, you know, give me a moment to make a ruling on that. Uh, I'll instruct the witness to answer the question, but for only the purpose of the effect on the listener, if you can clarify that with your witness, Mr. Wood. Sure. Any objections overruled? Detective, based on your conversation with Gilbert Police, did you take any action regarding any children involved in this case? Yes, we did. And for the purpose of, of what you did, what, what information were you given that you needed to look up on? We were informed through their investigation that JJ's J.J. Ballow's grandmother was concerned for his safety. Judge, and again, I'm going to object at this point. We can renew my objection. That's going beyond. I'll yeah. also stand that as, as uh, bringing up her statements to work. Okay. Based on your conversation with Gilbert Police, what was the next step you took in your investigation? 
when we were requested to do a welfare check on JJ Bellow from the Gilbert Police Department. The detective, had you ever met JJ Bellow? No. I. Were you provided any identifying information as to his age or where he might be located? We were provided very little information, just a brief description of what he looked like, his age, um, and where he should be, which was 565. Sorry, 565 Pioneer Road, where he lived with his mother, Lori Bell. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the witness be handed states of the one. Judge, I'm going to stipulate to the admission of states of the All right. It's being offered, Mr. Wood. Yes, Your Honor. There are states of the one has been offered without objection to the and your honor, with that stipulation, I'd actually ask that uh, the witness be handed States Exhibit 2 and States Exhibit 3 as well. Further stipulate to states exhibit two, stipulate to states exhibit three. Very well. Uh, then, presuming you're being offered states exhibits two and three are, are also admitted. And just a little bit, they're going to be published in the next which we discussed before today. Yes, I'll be doing that. Thank you. Detective, can you look at states exhibit one? What is state's exhibit? That is a birth certificate out of the state of Louisiana. Your Honor, where this is admitted, may I publish? Yeah. Detective, can you identify who this is a birth certificate? The name on my birth certificate is Keenan Todd Trahan. What is the birth date? May 25th, 2012. And where is the place of birth? Lake Charles, Louisiana. Your Honor, if I may publish states in the bit. Two, you know. the detective, I'm going to ask you to turn to the second page of states of the two. Detective, what is states of the two? It's a decree of adoption. And reading through that, do you are you aware of who that is a decree of adoption for? Yes. Who is it for? Kane and Todd Trahan. And on the bottom of that, can you read the second to the bottom paragraph that he wrote it? The entire paragraph. Yes, please. It is further ordered the judge and decree that the name of the child, Kanan Todd Trahan, be changed as follows Joshua Jackson Ballow and the Registrar of the Louisiana Department of Public Health and Statistics is hereby ordered to make the appropriate changes in his records. May I have all the states for the three year old? Yes. Second 
respective one of states is a little free. That is also a birth certificate from the state of Louisiana. And who is the birth certificate for? Joshua Jackson Vallow. Second, in the course of your investigation, in the course of your investigation, have you learned what Joshua Jackson or JJ Dallas looks like? Yes. Have you seen pictures of him? Yes, I have. Uh, were you able to access pictures of him from uh, iCloud accounts associated with his mother? Yes. Your Honor asked that the witness be handed states exhibit four. All right, the witness is handed the state's exhibit four. Detective, you testified that you never <laughs> met JJ Dowling, correct? Yes. Um, how did you come to know what he looked like? Through photographs you were given. Okay. Um, where did you get those photographs? We received a few from Gilbert Police. His grandmother, Kay Woodcock. I think that's that's all I can remember. And I spoke with you briefly before. Did you ever have occasion to review iCloud accounts belonging to uh, Lori Vallow? Yes, we did. And on those iCloud accounts, did you find other pictures of Joe, of JJ Vallow? Yes, we did. And did you find videos of JJ Vallow? Yes. Based on your investigation, what does Exhibit 4 purport to be? A uh, photograph of JJ Mellon. Hi. And you didn't take this picture, correct? Correct. But you recognize uh, that individual as Joshua J or JJ Mellon? Yes. Your Honor, for demonstrative purposes, the state would uh, move to admit the state's Exhibit 4. Any objection? Judge, there's a little bit of foundation that I one so, so what, what's the source of that picture for you? Lori's iCloud, Lori for style, iCloud.com. Judge, can we approach just briefly on this issue? <laughs> Based on a sidebar with counsel, I understand the defense does not have an objection at this point to exhibit four being admitted. Is that correct, Mr. Spire? Yes, Your Honor. All right, exhibit four then is admitted. Your Honor, may, may I publish to the jury? You know.
Like who who is that? That's JJ Bell. Detective, you were talking about receiving a request to do a welfare check, correct? That's correct. When did you receive that request? On November 25th, 2019, late evening hours, I received a call from Detective Pillar with the Gilbert Police Department, and he requested that judge. I'm going to object to this. Her request is a hearsay. Uh, at this point, I don't hear an objection on the first day, so you can proceed. Go ahead and repeat the question, please. What did you do in response to that request? On November 25th, 2019, I received a call from Detective Pillar, the Gilbert Police Department. He requested that I do a welfare check on JJ Bell the next morning. Because he wasn't able to get a hold of JJ or obviously stand as your side. Did you do a welfare check for JJ Bell? We did. What date did you do that? November 26, 2019. How did you go about doing that? On that morning of November 26, 2019, myself and Detective Dave Holden went to Lori Bellow's residence where we presume JJ was at. Uh, she lived at 565 Pioneer, apartment 175. As we approached, expecting to speak with Lori, uh, we noticed the defendant, Chad Daybell, and Alex Cox unloading a pickup truck near the garage area. And at this point, were you aware of who Chad Dado was? Yes. How would you learn about him? Through our investigation with Gilbert and communicating with Gilbert Police Department. And so you recognized who he was? Correct. And at that time, were you aware of who Alex Cox was? Yes, we were. So after you saw them, what did you do next? I got out of my vehicle and made contact with Alex. Um, he was standing at the driver's side of his pickup truck, and the defendant, Dave L, was on the passenger side. I asked Alex if Lori Ballow was home, and he stated that she wasn't home. I asked Alex if JJ was home, that we were there to do a welfare check. And at that point, Alex got a surprised, frightened look on his face, looked over at across the pickup at the defendant Daybell. Uh, the defendant Daybell then looked back at Alex. And initially, neither one of them answered my question. After they didn't answer your question, what did you do? I asked them again uh, if JJ was home, and Alex Cox finally answered and stated that JJ was with his grandmother in Louisiana. When you were given that information, did it cause you any concern? It did because I, I informed Alex that it was highly unlikely because his grandmother. Judge, I'm going to object at this point. We're going to be getting into a situation. I'll suspend that. Your Honor, I think we need the defendants have to testify what he said to Alex Cox. Okay, that's not what I understood where it was going. You may ask the question, Mr. Wood. Second, what did you say to Alex Cox? I informed Alex that it was unlikely because Kay. Judge, I'm going to object. This is going to lead into hearsay. Your Honor, this is a statement by a declarant on the witness seat. It it's cannot be hearsay. Overruled, and it is uh, permissible. So, objection overruled. What did you say to Alex Cox? I informed Alex that it was unlikely that JJ was with his grandmother Kay because she was the one who called him the welfare check. And what was the response to that? 
there was no response initially. Uh, Alex again looked over at the defendant, Daybell, and they kind of both just looked at each other. Um, and at that point, I asked Alex where I could find Lori Bell. And did he give you a location to find her? He stated that she was in apartment 107, which is the same apartment complex, just a few apartments down. What did you do at that point? At that point, I asked Alex if there was a way I could contact Lori and asked Alex for her cell phone number. And Alex told me that he didn't have her cell phone number. So, were you aware at that point that Alex Cox and Lori Ballow were siblings? Yes, through our our investigation with Gilbert, we knew that Alex Cox and Lori Ballow were extremely close. So, when Alex told me he didn't have his sister's cell phone number, I assumed he was lying to me. What did you do once you received that information? Myself and Detective Hope left the defendant, Dave Allen, Alex, at the pickup truck. We went over to apartment 107 and see if we can make contact with Lori. At that point, we were just trying to find JJ Vallo. And were you able to locate him at apartment 107? No, we knocked on apartment 107. There was no answer. So at that point, Detective Hope began knocking on neighbors' doors to see if we could get a hold of anybody who would know if they saw a little boy coming in and out of that apartment or who resided at that apartment. And while Detective Hope was doing that, I started walking back to my vehicle to call for more detectives to come over to our location. Why did you call for more detectives? Because of the deception from Alex, I wanted to figure out what exactly was going on. And we were going to start canvassing the area and knocking on doors. So, the more detectives we had on scene, the better it was for us. And, Detective, to clarify, when you first saw Alex in the chat table, did you speak with Chad Dabo? No, I personally did not. So I believe you testified that you started walking back to the original apartment. Correct. What happened then? As I was approaching my car that was parked in the alleyway, I noticed the defendant Daybell driving towards me in a black Chevy Equinox. It appeared he had just left apartment 175 and was headed towards me in the alleyway. So at that point, I stopped him to have a conversation. What did you ask him? I asked the defendant, Dave L., when's the last time you saw J.J. Vallo? And he stated it was in October in apartment 107 with Lori Bell. Did you ask him anything else? I did. I asked him how he knew Lori, and he stated he had only met her a couple of times um, and that he didn't know her very well. Did that response cause any concern for you? It did. Why? Through our investigation, prior to me making any contact with the defendant, Dave Bell, or Alex Cox, we knew that Alex, Gretchen, Chad, and Lori had been married two weeks prior to my conversation with them in the out. So, is it fair to say? You were troubled by his family. What happened after that? I asked Mr. Daybell, excuse me, the defendant Daybell, if he had Lori Bellow's telephone number so I could get hold of her. Um, and he stated he didn't have her phone number. Did you have any further conversation? I did. When I was speaking with the defendant Daybell, Detective Hope saw me talking with him and started to walk back to my location. As he approached, I again 
asked the defendant Dable's rewards number because I assumed he was lying to me based on what I knew. And at that time, he did give me Lori's phone number. Did he tell you why he didn't give it to you in the first place? He did. He stated that he felt I was accusing him of something. And had you accused him of anything? No, I simply asked him the whereabouts of JJ and asked him for his wife's telephone number. Detective, uh, during this interaction, were you wearing a bike here? No, I wasn't. Why not? In the detective division, most of our interviews are in a controlled environment. We call people in the police department. We have an interview, interview room set up with cameras. So most of the time, we're doing conducting our business and our interviews at the police department. It's very rare we're the first officers or detectives on scene. There is one body cam between seven detectives. <clears throat> Unlike patrol, where a patrolman is assigned a body cam, a detective is not assigned a body cam. What happened after you got that information from the I called my lieutenant at the time and told him what was going on. I felt that based on the deception and lies from the defendant, Dave Bell, who is JJ's stepfather, the lies and the deception from JJ's uncle, who is Alex Cox. I felt there was more going on with the whereabouts of JJ. And so at that time, I wanted to get everybody over there to see if we could figure out what was going on. So I asked, my lieutenant to gather some detectives and respond to my work. And then what happened? A few minutes later, uh, my lieutenant arrived with Detective Dave Stubbs, who had a body cam at that point. Um, we began knocking on doors. We went back to 175, which was Lori Dallas' apartment, and started knocking on her door. We didn't get any answer. And I apologize if I missed it. Who was your lieutenant? Ron Ball. All right, so after you weren't able to get any answers, what did you do next? Through our investigation, we learned that Lori Bellow's niece, Melanie Boudreaux, it was Melanie Klauski, no correction, Melanie Boudreaux at the time, it's now Melanie Klauski. She lived in apartment 174, which is right next door to Lori. So at that point, we knocked on her apartment as well to see if Lori or JJ was at that apartment. Did anybody answer? No, they didn't. What did you do next? I was instructed to go back to the police department, go to the prosecutor's office to see if we can obtain a search warrant to search the residence for J.J. Vallow, while the other detectives stayed on scene and started knocking on doors in that complex. At that point, our only focus was to find J.J. and to figure out what was going on. So we were going to exhaust every means that we could to see if we could do that. And that's why I went to the prosecutor's office to see if I could obtain a search warrant. Uh, and did you obtain a warrant that day? No. Why not? On the way to the prosecutor's office, Detective Hope, with the number that the defendant, Dave L. provided, called that number. There was no answer, but he left a message. Once we got to the prosecutor's office, Lori Vallow called back, and she was instructed to open the door. There were detectives outside of her door that wanted to speak with her. And are you aware of any other if any detectives were able to make contact with you that day? Yes, they did. Do you know who that was? Detective Stubbs and Detective Ball. And you had mentioned earlier that Detective Stubbs had a body cam on, correct? Correct. And do you know if their interaction with Lori Vallow was recorded? Yes, it was. Have you watched that video? Yes, I have.
At that point in your investigation, what did you do? After after Detective Ball, Detectives Ball and Stubbs had spoken with Lori Ballot, what did you do? What did you do next? We were informed that JJ was with a family friend. Judge, I'm going to object to this. Yeah. I'm not going to sustain that. Detective, did you speak with Detectives Ball and Stubbs about their interaction with the police that day? Yes. Did you speak with them that day? Yes. Did you watch the body cam of their interaction with Lori Ballard that day? Yes, I did. So you're aware of what she said to them? Correct. Based on what she said to them, what did you do next in your investigation? We attempted to locate the family friend to see if JJ was with her in Gilbert, Arizona. And who, do you know who that family friend was? Melanie Gibb. Were you able to contact Melanie Gibb? I was not. Did you have any interaction with Arizona Law Enforcement Day about contacting Melanie Gibb? I did. It was starting to get into the later hours of that evening. So I contacted Detective Pillar with Gilbert Police Department. And I had him go to Melanie Gibbs residence to see if JJ was there. Ultimately, we learned he was not there. About what time did you learn that JJ was not with Melanie Gibbs? Roughly nine o'clock at night. And what did you do when you found out that he was not there? I contacted uh, Lieutenant Ball and let him know, um, and we agreed to meet at the prosecutor's office that next morning early to obtain search warrants for those apartments. Okay, and just for clarity of the record, which apartments are you talking about? Apartment 175, which belonged to Lori Vallow, 174, which belonged to Melanie Rudro, and apartment 107, because that's the last time uh, JJ was seen based on the defendant Daybell's statements. Detective, were you able to obtain those warrants? <clears throat> yes, we were. What did you do? Well, what day did you obtain those warrants? November 27th, 2019, in the early morning hours. And on that day, did you execute those warrants? We did. Let's talk about that. Uh, where did you search first? We searched apartment 175 first. Was there a reason you searched there first? That was his address that we were given from the Gilbert Police Department, and that's where his mother lived. Uh, what did you find in apartment 175? So initially, when we broke down the door, everything looked ordinary. There were couches, there were papers on the table, there was food in the refrigerator, food in the pantry. We went upstairs, there were, there were beds, uh, pictures, everything seemed that, that people lived there. The thing that caught our attention was there were no clothes on the hanger in any of the closets. Zero clothes. Just a bunch of empty hangers hanging there like some people. Took the clothes off and, and left. Did you locate JJ in that apartment? No. Did you see any evidence whatsoever uh, to suggest that he had been living there? Yes, we did. There were a couple things. We located a child's Star Wars suitcase underneath a little crawl space under the stairs. It was mixed in with some, what I can best describe as 72 hour kits. And the kits had like uh, flashlights, flares, water. The suitcase was mixed in with those. We also found an old prescription bottle prescribed to JJ of Respiradone. 
and then we're showing these photographs of JJ in, in the residence. And did you see any other evidence of any minor children? No. Correct. We did. When, when we first went inside, there were some scooters and a small child's, uh, look like a small child's bike right on the porch. Okay. Did you seize anything from the home that day? We did. Uh, I seized the respirator and the suitcase. After you searched apartment 175, what did you do next? We searched 174, which was Melanie Goudreau's apartment. Everything appeared normal in there. There were no signs of JJ or anything that, that he was even there. But we also searched apartment 107, and that was completely vacant. There was there was nothing in apartment 107. Did you seize anything from apartments 174 or 107? We seized um, in the apartment 174, we seized some cash. Large amounts of cash that were found in the closet. And the only reason we, we seized those were for safekeeping because we had taken the door in there as well and it wasn't able to lock. So we took that. Did you locate any weapons in any of those apartments? So in apartment 175, when we were searching the garage area, we located several different style weapons, handguns, rifles. Uh, various calibers, army knives, and a lot of different weapons that were inside the garage. And and why did you seize those? Again, for safekeeping. Um, that apartment didn't lock, and so we took those. So it would be stolen. Did you find any evidence that JJ Ballow had been in his apartment 174? No. Did you find any evidence that JJ Ballow had been in apartment 107? No. Did you search any other building that day? We did. In apartment 175, we located a storage unit rental agreement contract. And on that storage unit contract was the name Lori Ryan. Uh, it had listed her as the tenant, and it listed the storage unit number as T52, and it gave an address of self-storage on Airport Road in Rexburg. So with that information, we were able to obtain a search warrant for that storage unit as well. And did you participate in the search of that storage unit? Yes, I did. did you, what did you find there? There were a few bikes, children's bikes. There were boxes of winter clothing, some ice skates. Um, there wasn't a lot in the storage unit. There was a personalized uh, a family blanket, a big blanket with family photos that were kind of sewn onto the blanket. Those photos had JJ Vallow, Tylee Ryan, and their sibling, Colby Ryan. There were pictures of Lori Vallow. But other than that, there was there was nothing else really in the store. When you perform these searches, were you looking for Tidy Ryan? No. So to your knowledge, she hadn't been reported missing. That's correct. Your Honor, if I could have a that button. Yes.
Mr. Wood, I understand this would be a good breaking point in this testimony for the lunch hours. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, we're going to go ahead and take our lunch recess at this time. Uh, before we do that, again, I will just advise the jurors please don't discuss the case amongst yourselves or with anyone else over the break. In addition, for those in the courtroom, we will be closing the courtroom, I believe, during the lunch break. Uh, so things you have in here will need to go with you. We'll reopen uh, upon the conclusion of the lunch break, and we'll still be under the courts. Uh, Governing order for courtroom conduct on the return. So, thank you everyone for complying with that. Uh, with that in mind, we are going to go on to the now. All rise.
Thank you. Please be seated. Mr. Wood, before we proceed, is the state going to be ready um, before it's in the direction? Is there anything to bring up? Uh, yes, if you have a sidebar about the issue, the evidence issue is not ready. All right, we're on the record now. This is CR 22211623, State versus Chad Guy Devo. The jurors are not present at this time. Had a sidebar with counsel. Uh, previously, a few of the exhibits that were offered and admitted had some reference material on them, uh, base numbers, et cetera, from uh, the case that incorporates the concern, and I believe. Mr. Wood, what you've done is figured out a way to remove those references from the exhibits. And the court would know those references were not published to the jurors, and they won't be. So the court will permit those references to be removed from the exhibits before they are published or provided to the jurors. Is that uh, how we're going to handle that, Mr. Wood? Yes, that's my understanding, Your Honor. All right. And is prior any objection from the defense to proceeding in that matter with those few exhibits? No objection. Okay, thank you. I'll make sure then with the original court exhibits to the jurors, we'll have that information removed before the jurors are either published the information or received copies of it. And with that, then I believe uh, there are no other issues to take up before the jurors are brought in. Is the defense ready to proceed as well, Mr. Pryor? Yes, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Then we'll continue with uh, testimony of this witness and Mr. Wood, if you're ready, we'll have the jurors brought in this time. Thank you. All 
All rise. Thank you. Please be seated. We concluded the lunch break at this time. We're continuing with uh, testimony of Detective Hermosillo and Mr. Webb. If you're ready, you can inquire now. I'm the witness who's still under oath for your testimony. Thank you, Your Honor. Detective, uh, before we broke, we were speaking about the search of a residence. Can you remind us what residence that was? I believe it was apartment 175. Um, and whose who's residence was that? Lord Dallas. Your Honor, the state would have asked that the witness be handed the state's exhibit. States Exhibit 7A through 7K. The witness is handed state's exhibits uh, seven A through K. They've been reviewed by defense. Must be reviewed in court. Detective, do you recognize state's exhibits seven A through K? Go ahead and take a minute to review them. Yes, sir. Uh, what do those exhibits look like to be? They are photographs that were taken of Lord Bell's residence in the morning of November 27th. And were you present? You justified or you were present at the search of that apartment on correct. that date, correct? That's correct. Did you walk through every room in that apartment? Yes, I did. Uh, did you take these pictures? No, I did not. Do you recognize them as true and accurate representations of what you witnessed in that room that day? Yes, or, I I'm sorry, in that apartment that day. Yes, I did. Um, 
Your Honor, the state is moving for admission to state's exhibits 7A through 8. Any objection from the defense? Why do you any objection? Yes, and use your microphone, please, Mr. Mm Clark. -hmm. May I judge? Yes. Officer, what time were these pictures taken? I don't know the exact time, roughly between 10 and noon, I would guess. Are you guessing or do you know? I don't know exactly what time she Okay. Who took the pictures? I don't know who took the pictures. What day did they take the pictures? I believe I testified November 27, 2019. Well, if you weren't there, how do you know if you don't know who took them or who? Yeah, should he just stay in the testimony? No, I'll, I'll allow it. You can continue to go there. I never once said I wasn't there. I was there the entire time on this. No, the question. The question was, you weren't there when the pictures were taken, were you? I wasn't there when they were taken. No. You don't know the condition of the home when the pictures were taken. Is that correct? I was there when the pictures were taken, not standing next to the photographer. Okay. So you were there when the pictures were taken. That's right. And, but yet you don't even know who the photographer was who took the pictures. Is that what you're telling me? That's correct. Is there a reason why you wouldn't know a photographer who's taking pictures for a police investigation that you're in charge of? I wasn't standing next to the photographer. I was inside the residence when the photos were being taken. At the same time they were being taken, I was standing next to them. Okay, but the question I asked is why is it that you don't know the name of the photographer when this scene was closed off for an investigation pursuant to a search warrant and you can't tell me who the name of the photographer was who took these pictures? There were a lot of people that were part of that search warrant. I can't tell you exactly who took the photographs. Well, that's what my concern is. Okay, so prior, and we're getting speaking objections now. If there's a continuing objection, state the grounds. Okay. Well, there were a number of people that were in and out of that apartment. Is that right? In and out of that apartment? No, sir. In that apartment, yes. How many people were in the apartment at the same time? Roughly 10. And you would know all of the names of the people that were in the apartment, right? Correct. Yet you don't know the name of the photographer who took the pictures. Is that what you're telling me? Yes, you are telling me, yes, sir. Judge, I'm going to object. Your Honor, I'm going to lay some more foundation. All right, you can lay additional foundation. And I'll also know it is a group of photographs. So if you have to work through them individually, we will. I'll note just an objection on 7 8 K and this will you can uh, seek additional foundation. Can you lay before I rule on the objection? Detective, you testified you were present that day. That's correct. Right. And you recognize these images as true and accurate representations of what you saw in that apartment. That's correct. And is it a true and accurate representation of the condition you, you found the apartment in? Yes, sir. And as you as you look through these pictures, is there any anything in there that is different than the way you found it? No. Your Honor, the state moves again for the admission. Objection again, Judge. There hasn't been a proper foundation. The officer can't even tell me who took the pictures. He doesn't know what time the pictures were taken. And the condition he's talking about is the condition that he saw, not necessarily when the pictures, in the condition when the pictures were taken. So there hasn't been a proper foundation here. All right. I've considered the objection. I'm going to overrule the objection as it relates to. Photographs when the officer has personal observation of the location. The one exception that I'll consider a standing objection on is on 7G, which is uh, different, I would say, than just showing the apartment. I'm not saying it's not admitted, but still under advisement, pending any additional objection or foundation. So, photographs with the exception of 7G are. Admitted and you can inquire further, Mr. Wood. Thank you, Your Honor. If I could publish those to the jury. Yes.
Tedley, can you tell me what you observed in States Exhibit 7A? That's the front door of apartment 175, front porch area. And is this the apartment that you searched? Like you were looking at? Yes. Detective, what did you observe in States Exhibit 7B? So as you walk into the front room of the apartment, that's looking towards the dining kitchen room area. Uh, there's a child's car suitcase sitting there. Like I testified earlier, it, it looked like it was lived in. There's still cups, things on the counter, paper towels, everything you the morning. What did you observe on State's Exhibit 7C? That's standing in the kitchen, facing the doorway. So the opposite direction of Black's photograph. You can see the stairwell going upstairs. There's still pictures on the wall, TV, thing, papers on the counter. Everything's looking on at that point, Joe. Third and states exhibit 7D. So, one, I testified about the crawl space under the stairs and the 72 hour kits. Those are a few of the 72 hour kits, along with the stove or suitcase that we have located. Would you, Your Honor, does the, does the court have a pointer? Sure. Yeah, I don't know what stuff the bailiff from the Melbourne Development Center. Can you point to what you're referring to? Describe the 72 hour kit. So these black, black. Black bags. Just to the yeah. Okay, go ahead. These black bags for the 72 hour kits. There's some underneath there that you can't see. There's some here, and then that's the Star Wars suitcase that I was referring to earlier. Okay. What did you put your mistakes? Is it 70? That's the top of the stairwell looking down towards the bottom of the stairwell. This, this part right here goes into the front room and then the front door is right here. What did you observe in Chase Exhibit 7 at? This is the master bedroom. So when you come up the stairwell, immediately to your left is this entrance here. Um, like I testified, there was bedding, pillows, everything looked normal in the room at that point. This is a, a bathroom as well. What did you observe in States Exhibit 7H? 7H is what caused some red flags for us when we were searching the apartment. Why was that? Because of all these empty hangers. Uh, people go on trips. Jeff, yeah, I'm going to object as unresponsive. There isn't a question here. That's a narrative. It's the same. Detective, I asked you why the empty closet was concerning to you. Because when we made contact with Lori Rallo the day before, 
she had lived in the apartment. She was in the apartment living. The very next morning, we served a warrant. This is what we found in the hangers. Why would empty hangers be concerning to you? Because it appeared to us that she grabbed her clothes, left everything else, and took off. Did you observe in states of visit seven I? This was a bedroom. If you walk down the hall towards the west, this is the bedroom on the right hand side. Uh, this is the bedroom we found Alex Cox, some of Alex Cox's belongings in. So this is the bedroom to the right. And what belongings of his did you find out? There was a uh, Plastic tub with some of his warnings and some hygiene things that had his name on it. Captain, what did you observe in States Exhibit 7J? This is the same bedroom. Uh, there's there's the, one of the plastic tubs that had some belongings of Alex. There's some uh, prescription pills up here that had Alex's name on them. And then there was some white Tyvek suits that were in the closet there. Right? What did you observe in states that it's seven K? This is the room to the left. So the, the previous room was to the right. This is the room to the left. It had twin beds, bedding, everything looked normal in that room as well. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the witness be handed states exhibit 7G again for further foundation. Very well. Do you recognize states exhibit 7G? Yes, I do. What does it report to be? A rental agreement uh, with the tenant of Lori Ryan. And you testified earlier about finding a rental agreement, is that correct? That's correct. Is this the rental agreement that you were speaking about? Yes, it is. And where did where was that located in the residence? In the master bedroom on a desk. In the corner. And you saw it there? That's correct. And is that a true and accurate representation of the rental agreement you saw? Yes, it is. Your Honor, I move for admission of states exhibit G, 7G. Any objection? No, John. Our exhibit 7G is admitted as well. May I publish? Yes. Is this the rental agreement we were just speaking of? Yes, it is. And you testified earlier about searching the storage unit, correct? Correct. Is was this the rental agreement that led you to that storage unit? Yes. Thank you. Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness be handed what's been marked as States Exhibit 8A through 8Q.
that then I'm going to ask you to take a moment and read you. So it's exhibit 8A through 8M. Like what do you state in the eight A to eight M report to be photographs that we have taken in the one seventy five in the uh, And what day were these photographs taken? November twenty seventh, twenty nineteen. And was this a, a part of the search that you testified to earlier? Yes. And you were present in the garage. That's correct. Right. Were these items laid out in this manner when you got to the garage? No. Were they taken out to be photographed? Yes. And did you observe that taking place? I did. Right. And other than moving those items to be photographed, are these uh, pictures? Are these items in the same condition that you observed on that day? Yes, in the same condition, like I testified to, we manipulated some of them so we get better photographs. And are they true and accurate representations of what you observed in the garage of that apartment that day? Yes. Your Honor, the state would move for admission of state's exhibit 8A through 8M. Or I'm sorry, I should have said 8L. Any objection as it relates to 8A through L? Judge, why do you have any objections? Very well. Officer, as before, were you present when the pictures were taken? Yes. Who was the name of the person who took the pictures? Detective Dave Hope. Were you present at the exact time that the pictures were taken of all of these items? Yes, I was. Who else was present at the time that these pictures were taken? I, I couldn't tell you who else was in the room. Well, we were in a garage, weren't we? Couldn't tell you who else was in the garage. There's so many people there that you don't know. No, I Your Honor, this doesn't go to the foundation. Uh, I'll allow a little more for dire situations prior to the moment. So many people in the garage, you didn't know who was there. No, I just can't recall their names at this time. They're not officers that work with you? They are. Okay. How big of a garage are we talking about? I get the test out of that. Two car garage, one car garage. As far as intervening with cause here, is this a foundational objection still? Judge, I'm trying to establish. Judge, I'll move on. Say that. All right. Uh, the court's considered foundation objection as it relates to exhibits A through L. All over the objection, and those may be admitted. Thank you. May I publish? Yes.
effective. What did you observe in states that eight a? So when I testified earlier about various uh, magazines, uh, weapons, there were knives. This is where we found those items. I, mean, I, I just want to stop real quick to clarify. When you say magazines, what type of magazine are you referring to? Magazines of one rifles. And you testified that you would use items to take pictures of. Correct. And what what did you observe in states to the AA? So here are some of the various magazines that we took out of some of the tubs. There's some ammunition. There's a, a few suppressors that screw on to the end of a gun to muffle the sound. Uh, there's a ghillie suit, uh, different different items in this photograph that we talked about. Could you tell me what you observed in states of the AP? So these were items that were located in black plastic bags, which are right here that we pointed to. So we simply took those items out of these plastic bags and laid them out so we get photographs of them. What did you observe in states of living eight C? These are various caliber ammunition in plastic bags that were located in plastic bags in the garage. When you say ammunition, those are for bullets, correct? Correct. What did you observe in states of the A B? This was one of the rifles that we had located in the garage in apartment 175. It's got duct tape here. What you can't see up top. Judge, I'm responsive. Yes. And I moved the picture so you can see the top. What did you observe on top of states of the like I was testifying to at the top of this rifle, it's threaded for a suppressor to muffle the sound of a gunshot. What did you observe in states of the AE? This rifle here is the exact same rifle from the previous picture. Uh, there's also another rifle that was in the bag, and that's this one here. This photograph was taken at the police department once we got the items back. Okay. What did you observe in states of the data? This is the rifle in the previous picture that was back here. It's just a close up of that rifle. What did you observe in states of the AG? Those are what I call the suppressors. From earlier, that there was a photograph of these two men on the garage floor. This is just a close up of both of those suppressors. What did you observe in states of the AG? These are knives that were found amongst the ammunition in the, uh, the rifles and the tubs. You described to the jury what you observed in states of the eight I.
is just a hand and then it's also rotated but it's still in the case inside the garage. Did you observe the station with a big J? This is a Halloween mask, or what we think is a Halloween mask uh, that was located in a plastic bag in the garage, along with duct tape and rope. You described the picture of what you observed in states of the 8K. Once we remove the Halloween mask, this is the duct tape and the rope I was referring to in a Walmart bag. I'm a refugee in certain states of the 8K. That is a passport uh, that's located in belongings in that garage belonging to Alex Cox. And Your Honor, I'd ask the witness who handed states exhibit 8M through 8Q. Briefly review states of the eight ten through eight two. Okay. Do you recognize those exhibits? Yes, I do. What do they purport to be? These are items also located in the garage of 175. Not yet. Did you observe these items with your own eyes? Yes, I did. And you saw these on November 27th during your search of the party 175? Correct. I believe you testified they were also in the garage. That's correct. Are these true and accurate representations of what you observed that day? Yes. Your Honor, I move for the admission of State's Exhibit 8M. Thank you. Any objection? Yes. One to your native objection, Judge. Go ahead. Officer, you previously testified that you, I don't want to put words in your mouth, that you staged certain items. Is that a fair assessment? Correct. And some of the items that you staged, or that I mean, what I mean staged, you, you removed those from packages or boxes and you laid them out to take pictures. Is that correct? That's correct. Did you take pictures of all the items in the garage or are these just selective pictures that you've decided to show today? We took photographs of the items in the garage, anything that we thought was evidentiary value, we took photographs. Of. Okay, so the question is, and or excuse me, the answer is then that you did not take pictures of everything that was in the garage. Is that fair? You know, Jack, you are, this is cross, not doesn't put a foundation of these items. I did to sustain that. We need to be on a narrow issue of foundation for admission or not, and we need to be allowed to cross later, of course. Okay. Yeah, so, so the question is, is that um, 
when I hear previously that you took items out of a package and then you took pictures of select items, did you take all of these items out of some sort of packaging and take select pictures of these as well? Yes, we took these out of tubs that were in the garage to close it. So when you were there and present going through the garage, and I don't, we don't know how big this garage is because you don't know. Um, you couldn't see these in plain sight when you went through them, correct? That's correct. So you don't know what was in the garage and what wasn't. These were staged by someone else who took the pictures that, correct? We took these out of tubs and took photographs of them. Who took them out of the tubs? I couldn't tell you what officer took them out of the tubs. When did they take them out of the tubs? Are you asking for a time, sir? I'm asking for a time, yeah. Roughly ten to twelve, I would say. In the afternoon, in the morning, when when? Ten o'clock in the morning. Okay. Twelve noon. And you were present when they were taking these out of the tubs. That's correct. And who took these pictures, officer? You take the vote. Judge, I have nothing else. Thank you. All right, I'll rule an objection on foundation relating to exhibits 8 M through Q and those of the Thank you. Yeah, I'll push it. Yeah. Thank you. Detective, can you describe the jury what you observed in state's exhibit 8 M? <laughs> That is what appears to be an email printed item um, that was located in the garage of 175. There's some handwritten scribbles on it, some names, <laughs> numbers associated with those names. And at, at the time that you found those documents, did you understand where they were that? No. Were you able to determine, uh, you said it was an email, who the sender of the email was? Yes. Who was it? Chad Dado. Could you, were you able to determine who the recipient of the email was? Uh, I don't recall the recipient. Just no. who sent it. Oh, I apologize. I didn't get that down. I just remember who sent the email. And do you, were you able to tell what date it was sent? I believe it was October of 2018. Is there a specific date? I would have to look at it a little closer. It says in the upper left hand corner. Second, I'm going to have to look at states of the data and if you can describe what you observed there for the jury. That's the same uh, photograph from the, from the last slide. And states exhibit eight O. Or is you O? Sorry. That's also more of the same uh, email papers from the last slide. Detective, if I were to have states exhibit eight M back to you, would you be able to tell the date? Get emails. Yes. What is the date on that email? October thirtieth, twenty eighteen. And then detective. What did you observe in states exhibit 8P? Those were also on the tab books written by Chad Dale. And then lastly, what did you observe in states exhibit 8Q? That was a cell phone that was also found in the front of the garage. Were you able to look in? Get that cell phone at any time. 
Um, as far as forensic work, yeah. uh, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you unless I looked at it to the report. Detective, we've been talking about this search on November 27th, correct? Correct. And at any time that day, did you locate JJ Valley? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What was the next step in your investigation to find JJ? Our next step was to talk to anybody that would take our phone calls. JJ was. Judge, I'm going to object. This is again becoming a narrative. Your Honor, he's still just answering the basic question. All the without objection. JJ was who we were looking for. And so we were exhausting every effort to find JJ. So we would call uh, his siblings, family members, any family friends, anybody that might know the whereabouts of JJ. So who were some of those? family members that you spoke with? We ended up speaking with uh, Brandon Boudreau, uh, Melanie Boudreau, um, JJ's brother, Colby Ryan. Gilbert Police ended up speaking with family members down there. That's who we spoke with. At any time during your investigation, did the scope of the search change to who you were looking for? It did. After we, was that? after we spoke with Colby Ryan, who was JJ's brother, he mentioned that he Judge, had, I'm going to object. This is your saying. Sustain. Detective, at any time, did the scope of your search change to include the search for Tidy Ryan? It did. And so let's go back to your search very briefly on November 27th. Did you see Tidy Ryan at that apartment at any time? No. And during your intermittent surveillance you talked about in early November, had you seen Tidy Ryan? No. Mm -hmm. Did you ever meet Tidy Ryan? No. Did you become familiar with uh, with who she was through your investigation? Yes, we did. How did you do that? After speaking with Colby, uh, our search encompassed JJ and Tyler. You know, I'm going to ask the witness behind it states is at five. I believe this comes in by stipulation. It does. Judge, we have stipulated the admission of this exhibit. The council would be so kind as to repeat the, the exhibit number. Five. Thank you. All right. Exhibit five has been offered and admitted. You can proceed, Mr. Wood. Thank you. Detective, do you recognize State's Exhibit five? Yes, I do. What is it? It's a birth certificate issues out of the state of Texas. You know, I may mean, I publish that for the jury. No objection. Go ahead. Are you able to read that on that the screen? Yes. You could point out with the point of the name of the individual for who that to who that birth certificate applies. The name is Tylee Ashley. And what was the date of her birth? 
September 24th, 2002. And where was she? Travis County, Texas. And just for purposes of the record, can you state who her father was? Joseph Anthony Ryan Jr. And who was her mother? Lori Noreen Cox. Through your investigation, have you learned of Lori Vallow's maiden name? Yes. What was it? Cox. Okay. So, Detective, you, you testified that at this point you were approximately when did the scope of your search widen to include Patty Ryan? It was after we spoke with Colby uh, on December 11th, 2019. Uh, we Enter JJ Vallow and Kylie Ryan into what we call NICMIC, which is the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. So on December 11th, 2019, we entered both of those children as missing and big. How does NICMIC work? It's a center where. I'm going to inject this point on the foundation. Mr. Rose, if there's any additional foundation or anything that has been more okay. well. Can you restate again what the acronym NICMIC stands for? National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And is that associated with the government entity? It is. Do you know which entity? Uh, I yeah. don't. Okay. Have you ever uh, used NICMIC before in your uh, job as a detective? Yes. How have you used it before? When we have missing children, you know, we enter and call NICMIC, enter the information, and it goes into a database. Mr. Wood, for the record, could you indicate what that acronym is? Yes, Your Honor, it's N C M E C. Thank you. If you'd like the detective, can you just state what that stands for again? National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Did you include any other law enforcement agencies in this search? We did. After November 27th, uh, we reached out for assistance from the FBI. Um, we reached out through Fremont County. Um, so we were, we were in contact with Gilbert Police, uh, Chandler Police, anywhere down there where JJ or Tylee uh, lived or could possibly be at. And did you ever try to contact Lori Daybell in regards to the whereabouts of her children? Absolutely. How did you do that? We tried contacting Lori by her cell phone. We also Attempted to contact. Well, let's talk about that real quick. Were you able to uh, talk to her? No, her cell phone was shut off. Okay. Did you ever attempt to contact Chad Daybell in regards to the location of the ship? Yes, we did. How did you do that? We attempted to contact him through his cell phone. And were you able to get in touch with him? No, it was also shut off. And at any time, did Lori Vallow ever call the Redsburg police to report to some children? Judge objection. Foundation. Uh, response, Mr. Wood? Uh, Your Honor, it's just a basic question uh, that I think it's in line with the question we've been going to. I don't know what additional foundation I can get for that. Can you find foundation is overruled? The witness can answer. Did you ask that in English? Did Lori Vallow ever contact the Rexburg police, to your knowledge, regarding missing children? No, she didn't. Did Chad Daybell ever contact the Rexburg police regarding missing children? And I'll renew my objection, Judge. Knowledge, foundation. It's overall. No, he didn't. Detective, when you um, place the children in the, the uh, NICMIC 
uh, database. Do you receive tips from that? Yeah, so we set up tip hotlines through NICMIC, also through the FBI and through the Rexburg Police Department. So uh, anybody with any information on those two missing children could call any one of those numbers and provide us with any information. And did you ever receive tips through NICMIC regarding JJ Vallow, Tyler Money? Yes, we did. What would you do when you receive those tips? When we would receive the tips, we would assign it a tip number. And those tips were followed up on by detectives or other officers. So as soon as those tips came in, they were given a number and assigned to an officer that they could follow. And would with those tips, when they come in, do they have a phone number associated? A lot of times they did have a phone number. A lot of them were anonymous. They didn't want to get involved. Um, so some of them had phone numbers where we could follow up, others didn't. And if someone submits an anonymous tip through NICMIC, is there anything you can do to follow up on that? It depends on the information they gave us, um, but we would follow up with any information that they had put on the tip. And when a, when a tip comes in with a phone number, would you call those individuals back? Yes. Did you ever alert the public that the children were missing? We did. We held a press conference on November 20th, 2019, and uh, alerted the public that we had two missing children in our area. And after that press release came out, did you receive tips after that? Yes, we did. And did you follow up on those tips as well? Yes, we did. Did any of those tips ever lead you to finding JJ Ballard? No. Did any of those tips lead you to finding the tiny line? No. Detective, regarding Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow, are you aware if a child protection action was filed in Madison County? Right? Yes, it was. Were you involved with that? I was. I was the one who wrote the affidavit. And what was the purpose of that affidavit? Judge, I'm sorry. I didn't hear what the officer's response is. I was the one who wrote the affidavit. Thank you. You don't want to ask questions? I will. I was just letting the witness drink the water. I appreciate it. Detective, what was the purpose of that affidavit? To get Lori to produce her children to the Rexburg Police Department or the Department of Health. And are you aware if there was an order issued in that child protection action? There was. Uh, what did it order? It ordered Lori Vallow to produce her children within five days of being served at court ever. <clears throat> Detective, were you ever able to locate Chad Day Bell in one down? Yes, we were. How did you do that? A few different ways. Some of the tips that came in uh, gave us location in Kauai. Also, do we set up on that? Judge, can I have some foundation as to the time, date, and location? Are there a foundational objection, Mr. Williams? I'll just ask some more questions, Your Honor. So, uh, approximately when did you learn about the location of the Chad Moore? Beginning of January of 2020. And you stated earlier, but I uh, what kind of tips gave you that information? Eyewitnesses that would call in that said they saw Lori and Chad on the island of Kauai. Okay, and where is Kauai? In Kauai. Did you ever write warrants uh, to eight or 
apply for warrants to aging and finding Chad and Lonnie? Yes. What, what kind of warrants were those? We wrote warrants for cell phone data, um, geofence location, a few different warrants through cell phone companies to assist us in finding Chad and Lori or their location. And then did any of the data you received from those help you locate them? Yes, it did. Jacob, did you ever go to Hawaii as part of your investigation? Yes, I did. And what did you do when you were, when did you get there? I got to Hawaii January 24th, 2020. And uh, once you got there, what was the purpose of going there? We went there to aid and assist the Pride Police Department in serving that court order to produce JJ Tiley to the Richmond Police Department. Uh, and did you see Chad Mori Nato in Hawaii? Yes, we did. You mentioned assisting the Kauai Police Department in serving that order. I, what is, are you aware if Lori Bala was served with that order? Yes, she was on January 25th, 2019. Uh, while you were in Hawaii, did you do anything else? We observed the Kauai Police Department serve two search warrants one on Chad and Lori's condo, and the other on the rental vehicle. Did you perform those searches as well, or just observe the Kauai Police Department do it? No, we just observed and let them serve. Do you recall where their condominium was located in Kauai? Uh, I don't recall the physical address, but it was Princeville. And is that a, a town or city in Kauai? Yes. Um, when you observed the search of the residents they were living in in Princeville, after the Kauai Police Department did their search, were you able to walk through that residence? Yes, I was. Right. What did you observe at that residence? Everything looked normal. Um, it, it appeared two adults were living there. Um, there were beach towels, two beach towels, everything was, was in pairs. Food in the fridge, couches, everything you would see in the Did you see J, JJ Valley there? No. Or did you see Ty Ryan there? No. Did you see anything that would have indicated to you that a child was living there? No, I didn't. Did you observe anything that would have indicated to you that a teenager was living there? No. Detective, to your knowledge, did, uh, did Lori Vallow ever produce her children to the Rexford Police Department for the department to help them out there? No, she didn't. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the witness be handed State's Exhibit 6. Detective, do you recognize states as it sits? Yes, I do. What does it report to be? It's a photograph of Tyler Ryan. Uh, did you, have, as part of your search, did you uh, look at Tyler Ryan's social media? Yes, we did. Um, to your knowledge, was this image obtained from her social media? It was. It was taken from her Instagram account. And so as part of your search, did you personally observe her Instagram account? Yes, I did. 
And did you personally observe this image on the Instagram? Yes, I did. Is this a true and accurate representation of what you observed on the Instagram? Yes. And and also, as part of your investigation, did you see other pictures of Tidy Lane? Yes, I did. Um, and is this individual is is that a true and accurate representation of Tidy Lane? Yes. Your Honor, the state would move for state's exhibit six to be entered into evidence. No objection, Judge. Very well. Exhibit six has been offered and admitted without objection. So it's in the record when we publish the tuition support. Thank you. Detective, is this is this the exhibit we were just speaking of? Yes, it is. <laughs> What was the username on that the account that you found that picture in? Tylee A. Ryan. Okay. And, and this individual is the Tylee Ryan that you came to recognize for your search. That's right. Okay. Detective, I want to ask you. About the, the phrase proof of life. Are you familiar with that phrase? Right. As a detective, what does that mean to you? Proof of life is any documentation, any video, photograph, anything that we can use to show the last time somebody was saw alive or seen alive. <laughs> Pursuant to your investigation, did you find a last known proof of life for Tyler Ryan? Yes, I did. How did you locate that? That was taken from Lori Ballow's iCloud account. And what, uh, do you know which iCloud account it was taken from? Lori for style at iCloud.com. And, and what was the the form of that proof of life. It was a photograph of Tylee taken at uh, West Dallas. Your Honor, I'm going to ask the state or the witness we have at State's Exhibit 29A, 29B, and 13. And I, I believe these come in by way of stipulation. All right, I'll take a look at um, the defense may as well. Judge, that's correct. Oh, by way of stipulation. All right. I'll just review those briefly. Then we'll... okay.
be submitted to the witness. And I will note that exhibits 29A and B and exhibit 13 are all admitted without objection. You can proceed, Mr. Williams. Detective, would you look at state's exhibit 13? What does that report? That is the photograph uh, taken from Warrior Styles, I thought he would testify to a reading of Tyler and West Dallas. If I'm in publish. Yes. You would just identify the individuals in that photograph. Sure. Uh, the little boy is JJ Ballo. The Tyler Ryan is in the middle, and her uncle Alex Cox is on the right. And as, as part of this exhibit, did it contain metadata? Yes, it did. And does the, did the metadata in this is well, can you describe the material what metadata is? Sure. Metadata is, is like a time and date, it has a time and date stamp with the photograph it's taken. So it's just data associated with the photograph. And this this photo was accompanied by metadata? That's correct. And what date was this photograph taken? September 8th, 2019 at 2.49 p.m. And you testified earlier that this was in Yellowstone? Yes. How do you know that that's Yellowstone? I've been there. So you personally recognize that location? Correct. Sure. Detective, revisiting this, this idea of proof of life. Um, throughout your investigation, were you ever able to find photographs dated later than that of Tyler Ryan looking? No. I, and can you describe just quickly where you found that photograph? From the iCloud account associated with Lord Bell. And and I believe you already said it, but just for purposes of the record, what was the name of that iCloud? Lord for style at iCloud.com. And, and how do you know that that account was associated with Lord Bell? The information attached to it and also the photographs that were attached. And when you say photographs, what type of photographs led you to believe that that was attached to Lord Bell? Family photographs, Lori Vallow's photographs with her in the photos. Detective, pursuant to your investigation, uh, are you aware of a last known proof of life for JJ Vallow? Yes, I am. Your Honor, I'm going to ask this. Uh, the witness we have in states is in at 14. I believe also comes in by way of stipulation. You come on our record, then Mr. Wood, it's been stipulated to you and more than it is. Is there an objection to the 14 minute group? No, Judge, it was entered by a stipulation of parties. Very well. Uh, 14 is admitted. Detective, what is State's Exhibit 14? That is a photograph of JJ sitting on a couch in what appears to be the front room of apartment 175. And where did you locate this picture? That was also on Lori for Style, I thought about it. And you mentioned 
you believe you recognize the location. I'm sorry, can you say that again? Yes, it appears to be the front room sitting on the couch that was found in Fort Dallas apartment, apartment 175. And did this picture have, well, may I publish a picture of one? Can you just describe for the jury what you observed in states in the picture? That's JJ Vallow sitting on the couch in red pajamas. And did this picture was this picture of the by metadata? It was. Is it is this the metadata that accompanied that picture? Yes. Can you what was the, the date of that picture? September 22nd, 2019. Did you know what kind of day it was taken? 11.46 a.m. And just to clarify, what iCloud account was that? Was that picture taken from? Also, Lori for style iCloud. So, Detective, you testified earlier that, well, you testified earlier that an order was served on Lori Bell to produce her children. Correct. And I believe you already testified that she did not produce her children. Correct. Now, what was the next step in your investigation after that? Our next step in that investigation was to reach out to anybody that would possibly know where JJ was. Um, who who would you reach out to? We reached out to family, uh, the FBI, other agencies, anybody that that would would take our calls, uh, teams that were coming in. Detective, while you were doing this investigation. Uh, were you aware of any investigation in Fremont County regarding Tammy Dale? Yes. And what did you know? Uh, were you a part of that investigation? I was a part of it, um, but my focus was mainly JJ and Tyler. And what was the investigation in Fremont County regarding? Uh, a suspicious death involving the defendant Dale's wife. And as part of your investigation, did you know when she had died? Yes. When was that? October 19th of 2019. You testified that your your primary focus was locating Tylee and JJ, correct? That's correct. Your Honor, we just have a very brief slide on so, Yes.
to make every effort to be concluding trial and stay at 3 30 including today uh, we are going to take our mid afternoon break at this time and just for your reference as well in case i forget to mention we'll be going through evidence and testimony again tomorrow uh, scheduled 8 30 to 3 30 and then with some scheduling issues we are going to not be holding court on friday and so we'll be back on monday i just want to make you aware of that schedule as well so we'll go until 3 30 today but at this time we will take our break so if we can try to keep the break to uh, 20 minutes i appreciate it with that uh, i'll apologize for the jury
Thank you. Please be seated. Council, while we're waiting for the jurors, we will take up on the record at the conclusion of today after the jurors can dismiss the issue of further stipulated exhibits, and I'll bring that up before we conclude for the day. All rise in this. Very present and accountable. Very well. Please be seated. All right, we're back on the record after our mid afternoon break. Mr. Wood, if you'd like to continue with the examination of the witness, and all my notes, of course, you're still under oath. So we'll Thank you. And I need to just take up a couple of issues for clarification of the record. Detective, uh, you spoke earlier about searching Lori Ballow's residence. Sure. And then, yeah, you stated the address. What city was that address located in? Rexford. And what state is Rexford in? Oh, yeah. yeah thank you. Detective, as part of your investigation, did you ever help execute a search warrant on the Daybell, on Chad Daybell's residence? Uh, I did. I executed uh, a couple of warrants. Okay. When was the first one? January 3rd of 2020. And Chad Daybell's residence, what county is that located? Madison County. Is what? Well, so what's his, what's his address? 202 North, 1930s. And is, is that, uh, and what city is it listed as? It's, it's listed as, as Rexford. It's actually in Fremont County, it's listed there. Okay, so just to be clear, did you just mean Miss Steve who said it was uh, in the city? I mean, it's in the city And it's what county? Fremont County. All right, thank you. Um, and you testified that you did a search there on January 3rd? Correct. Uh, was was that search in aid of another investigative agency? It was. Uh, which agency was that? Fremont County Sheriff's Office. And do you recall what the purpose of that search was for? Uh, I, I don't recall what the probable cause or the reason for the search was at that time. So you didn't write the affidavit. So. Did you have any other occasion where you served a search warrant on the Chad Data residence? Yes, June 9th, 
when you served that warrant on June 9th, 2020, what time did you arrive at the residence? Roughly about seven in the morning. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the witness be handed state's exhibit 10A. Detective, are you familiar with state exhibit 10A? Yes, I am. What does it look to be? It's a aerial image uh, taken from Google Earth of the defendant Dave Bell's property. So, who do you know who prepared that image? I did. Right. I, but you didn't take the picture? No. Yeah. Because it's a satellite photo, correct? Correct. Uh, have you been? I believe you testified you have been to Chad Daybell's residence. Yes. Have you walked around the grounds of Chad Daybell's residence? Yes. And have you been inside his home? I have. Are you familiar with the landmarks of that residence uh, in the yard? Yes, I am. Uh, and are you familiar with uh, you're familiar with the general layout of of the yard and uh, what's located in it? That's correct. And is this is this image an accurate representation of Chad Daybell's residence? Yes. Your Honor, for demonstrative purposes only, the state moves to admit Exhibit 10A. Any objection? Objection. Of what do you mean? Any objection? Right. Officer, uh, approximately how much property are we talking? I couldn't tell you the amount of property. And the prosecuting attorney mentioned the yard. Now, I believe the yard usually means where there's grass. So you're familiar with where the what's on the grass, is that right? I'm not sure I understand your question. Well, there's, and I'll represent to you that there's about four and a half acres out there. Does that sound close to me? Okay. Okay. And I'll represent to you that there's an area that's known as the yard that's a lawn area that you can go with a lawnmower. Are you following me? Yes, uh, this is testimonial. No, Judge, I'm trying to, he has, says that he's familiar with the yard. Well, I understand. Uh, I think we're going on to cross examination now, which will be permitted. The question is on an issue of foundation or other objection, whether or not the exhibit is admitted. So, Mr. Pryor, what would be the foundational objection? He has to testify, Judge, that he's familiar with the pasture, three and a half, four acres of property that go beyond the yard. All right, response, Mr. Wood. I think the uh, the question is accurate. All right, uh, based on foundation and with the testimony of the witness about his knowledge of this property, the court will overrule the foundation objection, allow the exhibit 10 a to be. Admitted and that you can delve into those issues to fight on cross, Mr. Pryor. Thank you. Thank you. Your Honor, I'll publish that show. Detective, so you, you testified that you executed a search warrant on June 9, 2020. Correct. What time of the day did you arrive at Chad Daybell's residence? Roughly seven in the morning. And I, was it only the Rexburg police or there other agencies involved? At that time, there was uh, Fremont County and Rexburg City Police that, that went to his house at seven. And did any other agencies help you that day on that search? They did. Who were they? Uh, the FBI, the FBI ERT team, which is an evidence recovery team, the Attorney General's office, 
Fremont County. I believe that that's it. Okay. Can you testify you got there about seven o'clock? Yes. So when you first arrived, who was Mr. So, uh, I do apologize. Could I have a quick sidebar with the council? I'd like to discuss this a little bit briefly.
All right, Mr. Wood, apologies for the court's interruption uh, discussing that last exhibit. You can continue with your direct examination of the witness. Your Honor, could I have the court reporter read back the last question I asked? That's kind of a half question. When you first arrived, who was the question before that was, and you testified you got there about seven o'clock? Answer yes. That's right. Thank you. Yes. Detective, when you arrived around seven o'clock, who who was with you at that time? There was myself, a Lieutenant Rumble at the time, Detective Kai Kamani, and Detective Bruce Madigan, and also Detective Dave Stubbs. All right. So can you go back to those individuals and say where they uh, who they were employed by role? Lieutenant Ron Ball with Rexburg Police, uh, Detective Stubbs is also with Rexburg Police, uh, Detective Kai Kamani and Matt Emily are both Fremont County Sheriff's Office. And, and just for clarity of the record, is Detective Ball still with the Rexburg Police? No. Okay, and is, I mean, <clears throat> what organization is he with now? Madison County Sheriff's Office. And Detective Kai Kamani, was he still with Fremont County? No, he's also with the Madison County Sheriff's Office. All right, that's just clarity, thank you. So when you got there, what did you do? Initially, we knocked on the front door. We made contact with Mark Daybell, who's the defendant Daybell's son. He answered the door, he was eating a bowl of cereal, it was early in the morning. We informed Mark of why we were there and that we needed to speak with his dad. He stated his dad was still asleep, and we showed him a copy of the warrant, and he proceeded to let us in and show us where his father was. And did you make contact with Mr. Haber that morning? We did. He showed us that he was sleeping in the bedroom above a loft, above the garage. So we walked up the stairs, just a few of us. Uh, Detective Pat and Matt, and we stayed back. Um, we informed Chad that we were there and needed to speak with him. He was still asleep. He asked that we get some clothes on. We allowed him to do that and came downstairs with us. And did you provide a copy of the warrant to Mr. Baybell? We did. And what happened next? Well, Mr. Baybell asked to speak with his attorney. We were standing in the kitchen area. He had a seat in the kitchen. And his attorney at the time was Mark Means. So we allowed him to speak with his attorney. Uh, at that time, Mr. Means wanted to speak with one of the investigators. Jerry, I'm going to object at this point. That's, that's fine, Your Honor. We'll stop that. Very well. Um, after Mr. Daybell spoke with his attorney, what was the next step in your, uh, in your portion of the investigation? I allowed Mr. Daybell to sit in the front room. He sat on his recliner closest to the door. His children sat on the couch in the same room. I gave Mr. Daybell a copy of the warrant and he read through search warrant while sitting in his recliner. He asked if he needed to leave the residence while we conducted business. We informed Mr. Daybell he didn't need to leave the residence, but if he chose to stay, he would be accompanied by an officer just for safety purposes. Um, after you had that conversation, what did you do? Mr. Daybell asked if he could make a phone call. Uh, and at that point, he was allowed to go outside and, and make a phone call. I, and where did you go? I went outside with him. Um, and what did you do after that? Mr. Daybell wanted to sit in the vehicle that was parked back in on the west side of the house as a west driveway. Um, so I allowed him to sit inside the vehicle, windows rolled up, and then a phone call. I stood in the grass area close to the vehicle. At this time, Your Honor, I'm going to ask to publish States Exhibit 10A. You may.
second. Do you have that under? Yes, I do. Okay. Can you point out the uh, where the front door of Mr. Daybell's residence is? In that image, or where it would locate? The, there's two doors. Um, I don't know which one Mr. Daybell used as a front door. I can tell you there's a door right here and a door on the back side. So we were, Mr. Dado was roughly, that's not the vehicle he was in, but it's roughly parked in the same area. And I was standing here in the grassy area. Um, earlier there was some talk about the yard or the grassy area. Can you just outline for the jury where, I'm gonna call it the grass area of the yard is located on that image. The grass area is right through here. And is, uh, is that a driveway um, behind the house as well? Yes, there's a driveway here. And to the, just east of that, what, what is that? Is that grass as well? Uh, there was grass here. There's a like a little shop area. There's a shed here. And then this is, I guess you'd call it pasture area. Did you observe any livestock there? No. Detective, um, you testified. If you can show again where Mr. Daybell was and when this and where you were in relation to him when he went outside to make a phone call. So Mr. Daybell was sitting in a vehicle fairly close to this location. He was sitting in the driver's seat, he was back in. I was standing here just observing Mr. Daybell make a phone call. And did you observe his behavior that while well, he was making that phone call? I did. Uh, what was what was the nature of his behavior? What was he doing? Initially, he was just on the phone, um, and I was watching him. But as the call progressed, he had the phone in his right hand and was intently looking over his right shoulder. And so I, I found it odd. I wanted to see what he was looking at. So I maneuvered myself to see what he was so intently looking at. And when you did that, did you attempt to orient yourself so that you would be looking in the same direction you perceived him looking at? That's correct. What did you see when you did that? So when the vehicle backed up here, he was looking over his right shoulder in this direction. I stood over here, kind of in front towards the roadway to see exactly what he was looking at. And when I looked that way, I saw this area, this pond area. Okay. Now let's look at that pond real quick. If you can just kind of run the, the pointer around it so the jury's sure where it is. Right here. And there's a there's a tree right here. Okay, thank you. And then a pond. And when at the time you noticed Mr. Dave looking over there, was there any activity going on over there? There was. So like I testified, we got there about seven o'clock um, when we made contact with Mr. Daybell and the scene was secure. We radioed for the other units that were staged about a mile and a half down the road that they can come start marking things off in the search warrant. So as time passed, Mr. Daybell was reading the warrant on his recliner. While he was doing that, there were ERT members and other officers that started marking off different sections in the backyard that we wanted to search. Now, Detective Lee, just for clarity of the record and for the jury, I, I believe you defined ERT earlier, but can you uh, tell the jury again what ERT is? Evidence Recovery Team. And, and who are they associated with? With the FBI. Now, Detective, were you the, the lead of this, of, Excuse me, executing the search warrant that day? 
but I wasn't in charge of the search warrant. So, kind of just, just for clarity again, what did you see when you looked in the direction you thought Mr. Bagel was looking at? And, or I guess, what activity did you see? There were some ERT members marking off a section under this tree, right next to the, on the east side of the pond area. So right in this general location. What did you do next? In, in your part of the search that day? I was tasked with going into the backyard and sifting through what we determined was a fire pit. Can you show the jury on that map or on that picture where the fire pit is located? Um, and you said, I apologize, but for the record, would you have the witness please reference where that point was just from somehow so there's an oral representation? Yes, detective, if you can point there again and describe what it is you're pointing at, where it is you're pointing. The fire pit area, which there's, there's like a little tree here, it's just to the north of the tree. Yes. Is that adequate, Your Honor? It is. So you said you you went north of the fire pit. Exactly what did you do? So a few of us were tasked with getting dirt and anything that was in the fire pit and putting it through a sifter. So that's originally what I was tasked to do by the team leader of the ERT team. About what approximately what time would you do that? I'd say roughly probably nine in the morning that one. Who was the team leader of the ERT team? His name is Steve Daniels. And, and how long did you uh, sit in the fire pit? Uh, I would say probably 35, 45 minutes. And so when you when you sifted, what, what kind of what kind of tool did you use to do that? It was a, a wooden sifter. Um, we would scoop shovels full and put it in the sifter and wooden handles you would just shake back and forth. Um, and any larger debris would stay on the top of the wire screen. And did you did you know did you find anything of interest while you were sitting in the fire pit area? Not at that time. No. Did you move to another uh, another area of the search? I did. Um, well, when, when approximately did you do that? You asked for a time. Approximately, yes. Probably. 10 ish maybe. And I, why did you move? There were ERT members and some other members of law enforcement that had marked off a place under this tree next to the pond. They had called and wanted some other people over there to help with that area. So I left the fire pit area and responded to. This section right here next to the tree in concrete. And what did you observe when you got over there? I observed ERT marking off. Uh, they had already marked off a probably a six by six section. The best way I can describe it is there was taller shrubs um, in the middle of the six by six section. It looked like there was just a little bit of grass, probably the length of sod, and some dirt protruding through the grass, but there were no taller shrubs that are on the outside of the section. Um, what happened next? 
the ERT team began excavating that site. Um, they removed a top layer of soil, took off the shrub and the, um, the top level of dirt. And what did you see under that? At that point, uh, you could see what appeared to be three large white rocks. And as soon as they did that, we could start to smell um, the odor that, through my training experiences, is decomposing blood. Uh, let's talk about that. Um, have you, on other occasions through your work, smelled the decomposing blood? Unfortunately, yes, I have. And is there a distinctive smell to you that, that you associate with that? There is. And it's your testimony that as that first layer of ground was lifted off, you began to smell that. Mm -hmm. That's correct. What did you observe next? After they slowly and methodically dug around the white rocks, they were removed. Um, ERT took pictures and measurements. They continued to dig down right below the layer of rocks or two pieces of thin wood family. Just right, right below the, the rocks. Um, were you still able to smell that smell you described? Yes, as they dug down, it, it got stronger. Were those boards removed? They were. What did you observe after that? So after the boards were removed, you could see the discoloration of dirt. So you had dry dirt, um, and then underneath the boards was like a wet, moist type dirt. So it, it was pretty obvious there the distinction between the soil. Then what happened? They continued to brush away the, the wet soil. And at that point, you could start to see a black round object start to protrude, protrude through the dirt. And describe that object as about what size was it? Initially, it, it just looked like a, a littler black round object. Um, they dug down further carefully and, and it appeared to take shape of the crown of a human head. What did you do after that or what did you observe once that was uncovered? So once the black round object was uncovered, at that point, the ERT team leader, Steve Daniels, got a small, sharp instrument and made a slit in the black plastic. Um, he kind of opened that up just a little bit, not to damage or manipulate any of the evidence. But underneath the black plastic was a, another white layer of plastic. So he used that same instrument and cut a slit down the white plastic and kind of opened it up. And at that point, it looked to be brown human hair. After that was discovered, uh, what happened next? As soon as that was discovered, we received information on the radio that the defendant, Daybell, was leaving his daughter's residence, which was Caddy Corner, to his residence at a high rate of speed. At that point, Mr. Davo was pulled over and subsequently placed in custody. Did you go back to uh, the site where the what appeared to be a human head was located? I did. Um, when I got back to what we ended up calling burial site, they continued to excavate um, around that black uh, plastic and after they excavated and took the dirt off the plastic 
it revealed um, what appeared to be a small body wrapped in black plastic with duct tape around it. Thank you, Your Honor. I've been over time. Yes, this will be the place to stop for the day. All right, we are going to try to adhere to this court schedule. So it is three thirty. This time, then, I am going to complete trial for the day. I've got one additional issue I'll take up outside the presence of the jurors. However, the jurors will be excused here momentarily. Uh, as you're leaving for the evening, then, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, as I will try to remember to tell you each and every day or when we leave the breaks, uh, on the breaks, please do not discuss this case amongst yourselves or with anyone else. Please don't do anything to investigate this case. If you see any media coverage of the case, please try to avoid that so you can have an impartial. And with that in mind, uh, that will conclude our first day of evidence. So uh, we'll allow the jurors to be excused at this time. All rise, please. Thank you. Please be seated. Now, Detective, if you want to go ahead and step down off the stand, we're going to just argue with this motion. Uh, Council, this isn't necessarily a motion, it's just uh, what I want to get on the record in terms of stipulated evidence the parties have agreed to. I'll note that back on February 27th, the court received a pleading uh, stipulation on introduction of specific evidence. The list contains 74 separate items the parties have determined will be admitted at trial by stipulation. And let me just first uh, begin there and inquire from the state, is this still an accurate representation of evidence that's going to be Proffered and admitted by stipulation to your understanding. To the state's understanding, it is, Your Honor. Okay. And Mr. Pryor, you did uh, review that before it was filed. You signed as well. Is it still your understanding that those listed items on the pleading are not going to be objected to if offered by the defense? And by the state judge, that's correct. Yes. Very well. All right, so counsel, I am going to then indicate on the record that those particular items of evidence are to be admitted by stipulation. Uh, the one thing in keeping our record straight is that those are listed out in a one through 74 listing, but those do not correspond with the evidence markings in the case in other words those are not the exhibit numbers or letters that will be admitted in trial so i'll keep the list running but each one of those of course needs to be independently marked and admitted with independent trial uh, stickers so the exhibits are kept straight in the record and our clerk will assist with that as they come in but i assume all of those are going to be pre-marked and admitted and if you wish to reference them on the pleading throughout the trial, you can do that, but you need to make clear that uh, all those exhibits are not, in other words, the pleading does not correspond to the actual exhibit that was on the trial. Is that the state's understanding? Yes, Your Honor. And maybe if I may ask for some clarification from the court. Yes. We do have in here, one of the stipulations covers um, essentially documents that are in relation. If we have a business record affidavit or a custodian of record affidavit, then we would stipulate that the documents covered or the exhibits covered would be admitted. Does the court want us to introduce those business record affidavits or custodian of record affidavits as their own exhibit? 
I'll let defense weigh in, but I think that makes the most sense to me. Separate affidavits should be admitted as separate exhibits, so those can be tracked down later if someone's referencing the record. Judge, they're stipulated exhibits, so uh, I'll let the prosecutor decide how they want to handle that. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor, because I think at the end of the day, the affidavit itself is stipulated to, but really what matters is the content and documents covered by that affidavit or what's actually going to be admitted as evidence. Okay. So, but we have those if the court would like those admitted as well for the record. Yeah, so they'd be, they'd be separate. The affidavit itself, uh, laying foundation for the other exhibits would be a separate exhibit. Yes. To judge, you will note that um, of my 54 exhibits that the state has agreed and stipulated to admit, um, the individual exhibits are the same numbers as the stipulation that we put on the record. So, in other words, um, number one on the stipulated uh, list uh, makes mention of some phone cell right information. The actual exhibit itself is the same number that I've been offering. It just happens to be the contents within that phone celebrate. So my numbers match up corresponding to the stipulation that the court has exactly. And I did that for ease of convenience for every one judge. Okay. And if they if they do match, we'll just reference that. If they don't, um, this, I guess the point is the stipulation itself is not any kind of controlling document as to what the exhibits actually will be marked as in the record. So we'll mark each one as it comes in on the record and make clear that uh, this is sim simply a reference, basically. If they correspond, they do if not, to clarify that and it should be admitted in terms they're offered as your evidence is introduced. So uh, that will conclude then my concerns on stipulated evidence. Is there anything else we need to know this afternoon before we break for the day from the state? No, Your Honor, thank you. All right, anything further from the defense? Judge, just briefly, the state and I will meet about that issue that we had uh, at the sidebar, just the last one to discuss uh, the parameters. Okay, uh, I would suggest counsel will want to start with further testimony at 8.30, so if the parties want to be available at 8 tomorrow morning, we can take up any matters outside the jury's presence before we get the jurors uh, back in the court in the call room. So that will be our schedule for tomorrow. Okay, thanks everyone in attendance today for complying with the court's conduct order. Uh, you can be excused and we'll keep it going today. Thank you. All rise, please. Thank you. Folks, make sure you take all your things with you.